G'day folks, it is The Coach here and I am pretty excited. I'm always saying that. I'm always saying that I am excited. I am. Ex it's a very fun fact. In Australia, there was this legend called, um, yeah, the, a big Kev his name was and he's passed away in the 90s, I think it was, but he, he had this like famous television thing going, I'm excited and I've just realized that I'm just sounding like Big Kev. But g'day, hello, welcome. It is The Coach, and we are talking about uh, advancing your hobby. And I have an absolutely legendary guest who's going to help us understand the methodology, the techniques, the tools, the tips, the ideas, everything that you need to know to help you get better in your hobby, regardless on how you play and want to paint your army. The person who's going to take us through all of this is a commission painter, but not just a commission painter. He is a gentleman who has a YouTube channel so you can follow your own tutorials. He is an award-winning painter. He is someone that I've personally met and been inspired. And I think, Oscar, we were talking about you coming to Australia last year. Yep. We were talking about it just before COVID kind of hit. But we wanted to set up you some workshops in Australia because I've been an absolute fan of your hobby it is Oscar Lars. If you don't know who this is, go follow this gentleman. Uh, the channel description does have, <laughs> the show description does have his show. But hello, hello, hello. G'day, Oscar. Hey, how's it going? So I'm, I'm really, really glad to be on this show. I, I'm a big fan of your work too. And, you know, as soon as you reached out to me, I was very excited to be on this show. And I'm excited to talk to you because one of the things that I have been really excited about and um, anyone who's been following the channel, anyone who's been following my uh, my Twitter has seen that Gargant has been something that I've been itching. It's been really like I've been ha having a bit of a hobby lull actually because <laughs> I've, been, I've been wanting Gargants and I've been trying to buy Gargants and I've been looking at these Gargants and I've been thinking I want a Gargant that isn't what is on the box art. And for the last couple of months, it's been really, I wouldn't say stressful, but it's been a struggle to try to think about how do I bring this concept to life? And I, I do this research and then I'm, I'm introduced to techniques and I see these things like color wheel and OSL and, you know, true metallic metal and non-metallic metal. I'm seeing basing, I'm seeing colors. And I'm, like, there's so much information and so many choices for hobby. It gets confusing. So I think I wanted to talk to you about, really kind of distill, distilling it down as from like a like an amazing painter's point of view and talk me through how do I bring a concept to life and then bring those tools and those techniques for the right choice because I don't think every choice is right for the right time it's like a toolbox right and you as a commission painter as a master painter as an award-winning gentleman you know it all <laughs> and I want to know how to to tap into it. And I think the chat wants to know. And I've got a heap of questions, including some that have come from Twitter as well. So um, is there anything you want to, you know, share with us, you know, before we kind of kick off into the formalities of the, the questions? Um, you know, I'm, I'm a sucker for question. I, I, I feel like the pressure is on right now. You know, I'm, I'm following not only Vince and Sam, who did a, a video on, on this uh, topic a week ago, um, but also, um, you know, Rob Hawkins was on your show. Uh, he's a, I'm a big fan. I'm a huge fan of Rob Hawkins. So I'm excited to be, be on this show, but I'm, I'm feeling the pressures up, but let's fire away some questions. I'm, I'm all down for it. Uh, there's no pressure. And obviously this <laughs> show is not about Gargans folks. Um, this, there is no, there is no issues when, when it comes to the Gargans. It's more about just bringing a concept to life. So, I want to kick off by by understanding, you know, like how did you get into miniature painting as well? And how did you even get into commission painting? So first off, how did you even get into hobby? And then how did you get into commission? Yeah, um, I started um, getting into Warhammer when I was uh, between five and six years old. Um, so very, very young. I got introduced by my sister's friend, had an older brother who played Warhammer and I tagged along with my sister when she visited the friends so that I could look and, and check out them when they were playing the game and, uh, you know, mind blowing stuff. Right. And this was back in 95 and 94. So, uh, once I, uh, turned seven, my dad took me to the local store, which is in Sweden where I'm from, um, who, uh, there was a, a place there and some of the Swedish listeners may recognize Tradition. 
uh, which used to be a store. I don't know if they exist anymore, but maybe. Anyways, I don't, I don't uh, recognize it, but I'm also not Swedish. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think it's a very Swedish store, um, but they sold games, right? D&D &D, and they had all types of Warhammer stuff. And, you know, the guys that were working there, they had their little, you know, pink styrofoam carved, you know, pine trees and a little game where they were playing some small skirmish games of Warhammer 40,000 and Warhammer Fantasy. So I got in and he bought me, my dad bought me some paints, a brush and... Uh, also, some so the first pack of Warhammer that I ever got was those Skaven clan rats. Um, that Monopost ones, the ones that Monopost like little halberd type things. Nope, they had the sword and the sort of shield oh, on the side. And the, the the shield was the one that were different. So they had a couple of different versions of it. But but yeah, those were those were the ones. The halberd were the metal ones. So I, I got the plastic box, which I'm sure was like one of the first plastic boxes that they produced. Um, I also remember those monopost orc uh, boys that me and my friends used to paint up. But, but yeah, so I got in, I got in real young, um, and I, maybe that's the reason why I refused to grow up and, you know, get a proper hobby. <laughs> and it turned into my work. Up. Yeah, I. When I was in my teens, I started doing, um, you know, commission paintings for my my friends and you know people around the city that would see that I could paint a little bit better. I've always been into art. So, you know, painting Warhammers was something that I, I really got into. And then once I, I got into, um, you know, after 18, 20 years old, I started doing more stuff for people that I weren't, wasn't associated with. So people that contacted me online, for example, and, you know, uh, and then once I moved over to the United States, I started working as a commission painter with Frontline Gaming. Uh, which I worked with for a while. I'm still doing some commissions for them, but nowadays it's more of my individual. I I, I book up pretty fast. Um, but but they you know had there was a lot of 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 work for me to do for them. So it was a great opportunity to really get down and hone my skills um, and learn new things uh, first and foremost. And I, I painted commissions while I put myself through art school five-year degree in, in bachelor's in fine art. And uh, and then once I graduated, I, I decided to open up my own business and go full-time and painting Warhammer for people. So that's how Oscar Lars Painting Studio became more of an official um, thing. I love it. And by the way, I just want to call out in the chat, Robert Lewis has said, you don't stop playing because you grow old. You grow old because you stop playing. That that's is a right. tattoo. That is yes. a tattoo that I would put on the back, on my back. That would be yep. my tramp set tat. Love I like it. that. <laughs> I love that. That's Great. awesome. I, I love that. Well done there. Um, so cool. Okay. So we, we got a bit of a background and, you know, mm -hmm. and not everyone's a, com uh, a commission painter. I certainly would be happy to be a commission mold line cleaner. But let me start off with a bit of a high level to kind of go, cool, let's talk about advancing our hobby. And I did kind of preface this when I started talking about, all these different techniques, you know, there is the color theory, uh, OSL, you've got, you know, there's uh, like, uh, there's just so many that we could talk about, you know, um, zenithal priming is another one that kind of gets thrown mm -hmm. around. There's all these techniques and tips and, you know, there's tools out there, you know, anyone that kind of goes on the internet and starts looking at basing tools or looking at green stuff, or is thinking about, you know, breaking away from the GW uh, texture paints and like, cool, I'm going to find something different. There's just this massive just dump of options available. And it can be quite overwhelming. Which technique do I master? Which tools do I buy? How do I improve my hobby? I've started as someone who plays with GW paints only. Um, do I even go into other places, you know, Vallejo or Army Painter? Do I by, you know, Winsor Newton brushes. There's just so much going on with hobby that I'm sure that you would just tell me to, to stop, take a step. <laughs> and it's like, let's, let's understand why you're doing what you're doing. So yeah, high level blue sky overview. Give me that kind of that 30 foot view. What are the keys to bringing a concept to life? Regardless if it's just painting the box art, whether it's doing something grand for armies on parade or something in between, yeah. what are the keys to bringing a hobby concept to life? Um, I, I think the, 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 the most obvious one is definitely that you need to be passionate about what you're doing. You know, if you don't have the passion and if you're just 
doing it because you're doing it for someone else or you're doing it because you want to impress someone and maybe that drives you and gives you the passion that you need to finish the project but but you need to find an idea that you connect with on some level and that you f want to excel in and find the inspiration to do um i i, I think that when it comes to um you know the tools that you require and the techniques that comes after you've defined what it is that you want to do so for example uh, you know if you want to theme an army that that feels like it needs to be magical it needs to have a lot of magic then going for something like you know non-metallic metal on the entire army maybe isn't the thing that you are supposed to go for because maybe osl is something that you prioritize because it gives you the opportunity to do all these glowing things and glowing things is great to represent magic because it's something that you kind of put a either it comes off of the model of a, of, a, of 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 an of an of a detail on the model or it comes from somewhere else and shines on top of the model and i see both being done and, and both being very very cool um so you know, if you have something that you feel like needs to be emphasized, the technique should enhance that idea rather than doing a technique to do a technique because it looks cool, which can be another thing to do as well. But but that doesn't necessarily mean that it enhances the idea that you're trying to go for. Yeah, like when I look at my gargants, you know, like do I try to cram in everything? You know, do I try to do Zenithor highlighting and, you know, prime it, you know, using a couple of different spray cans, for example? Mm. Do I then kind of try to find OSL and try to find this light source? But then wait a second, gargants don't traditionally have a light source. Um, right. Or do I try to create one like or, or organically? Um, there's a whole bunch of different things that it can be quite overwhelming, but then kind of once you start to narrow down an idea and we'll talk about the process of narrowing down, yeah. that's when kind of YouTube, Twitter, Instagram can just have this overwhelming but awesome opportunity to type in. If I want to learn about green stuffing, there are tutorials and people like yourself making really fine videos to teach me all the tools, tips and techniques to yes. master that type of that type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Absolutely. I, I, I think that um, YouTube is, I mean, when I started out, I did not have YouTube. I barely had anywhere to go for inspiration. Are you so like I, me? Are you like me and you started with like how to paint Citadel models or miniatures, that little games workshop book they'd put out once every yep. year, once every two years? Yep. Yep. Exactly. I, I it was, you know, not 96. What I, <laughs> what I used as tools was there, there was this booklet wargaming terrain i think it was called i see the picture how to, how to make yep how to make mm -hmm. miniature wargaming terrain i've yep. got that as well yep and, and and then white dwarfs essentially just looking at what it how how do the colors look on these models and it doesn't necessarily have to be you know that you have all of this smooth blending i mean back then it was mostly just solid block of color and that was it you know and don't, forget, a highlight your or your, two. don't forget your goblin green basing it That's was right. sand Goblin Green, everybody, regardless yep. if you were in the grim dark 40k yep. <laughs> or if you were in the, the Warhammer Fantasy world, everybody yep. had Goblin Green basing. Yep. And you would even paint the rounds of the base yep. or the, 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 the squares in Fantasy mm -hmm. green, yep. um, which I know freaks Vince, Vince Venturella out. I know he's very strong on it should be a black rim. Yep. Um, but having a green rim, that was the thing. That was the style of the times. I, I have a client um, that uh, I've done – uh, green rims on for his models and he loves it. He thinks it's really fun to, to play around with that mix of like back throwback to the nineties and eighties and then mixing in some of the more contemporary styles of painting. Uh, so, you know, again, you know, you, you, you have a good reference right there. You know, some painters are, and, and judges since Vince is a judge also should be noticed that, you know, some, some painters and judges, they have their opinions and they have what they like and what they don't like. I do too. Um, you as a painter got to always make sure that you paint for you. And if you like green rim bases, you do green rim bases, you know, hashtag it is your hobby. Um, That's like right. I, somebody in my discord literally yesterday was talking and asking some advice around 
the Lumineth, I think it was the Dawn Riders and their banners, and I was asking about, or maybe it was some, some, other, some other Lumineth model, and they're like, you know, how should I paint my, my banner? Should I paint it the same color as my army, or should I do something different? And, you know, I, my response was, you know, traditionally you paint a banner that's very complementary to the colors you're using, but it's your hobby. Do what the hell you want. And I think yeah. that's part of the breaking of the mold as well, is to say, if you want to paint uh, a blue blood letter, do it. Yeah. If you want a yellow goblin or if your human is, uh, I don't know, a charcoal color. So my Gargans, for example, I'm going to make them a charcoal skin. And I, I got to cool. that. I want to have a, not a black skin, not a brown right. skin. It's a charcoal like it's because it's coming from the the realm of Akshi. So I wanted more of like a, a the gray kind of charcoal -y type skin. Mm -hmm. And I've never seen that done. And I don't care what people think. It's my hobby and I'm going to do what I want to do. That's right. a story behind it. And I'm going to apply tools, tips, and techniques to get me there. And I think that's one thing we got to get comfortable with our own skin is just do what you want to do. That's right. That's right. And, and and doing what you want to do doesn't mean that you ignore the advice of other people. Uh, doing what you want to do means that you have a concept and you are open-minded enough to let the the world that we live in with all these social media that bombards you with information and pictures and things that can inspire you and let that sort of be okay i'm not gonna let these pictures affect me i'm gonna take what i want from these pictures and let that affect my art yeah dana howe is a perfect example another wonderful painter uh then go go check out dana but dana has got a very 80s kind of i think it was a necrons she kind of like had done some really like high glow, uh, very, you know, pinks and purples and mm -hmm. this very like 80s uh, what's, what's synthetic feel. Mm -hmm. And I've never seen that done before in that scheme with Necrons, for example. Yeah. But again, it looks amazing. And yeah. uh, by following through and listening to advice, you come up with something that's truly unique. So, yeah. um, which is kind of leading me to where I want to I want to ask you next. And it's almost like a two part question. One part's from the chat. It's just kind of very complimentary. Is where do you draw your inspiration from, and what are you currently working on? Okay, uh, so let's start with um, what I'm working on right now. I'm working on two things. Uh, I'm working on. I'm working on. Oh my god! I'm working on three things. Um, I'm working on my Squig army, uh, which I am uh, uh, trying to really make very saturated, really poppy colors, a lot of it, and, uh, and, and really kind of explore a little bit more saturation. Um, and then I'm also working on Necromunda, and that's both building and painting. So right now I'm, I'm, I'm painting Cal Jericho, uh, and... Um, Lastly, yeah, here's my Necromunda gang. Which I, I, I thought this was a good time for me to yeah. bring this photo. So, <laughs> so Oscar did bring a couple of reference photos as well. So this is one example. So if you're wondering why should I listen to this bloke, uh, what does he know about miniature painting? I've never heard of Oscar Lars. Well, here is one of the many examples and why you should go sub to his channel and go follow him on, on, uh, on Twitter and Instagram if you've got one. Yeah, um, <laughs> thanks for that. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the um, the Necromunda gang right here. Now I don't have a, a, a picture of Cal Jericho except for you can actually go to my uh, Twitter uh, page right now or my Instagram and there's a, a work in progress photo of him. Uh, but this is my Goliath Necromunda gang. So I've been working on these for a few months since I I, I paint these essentially after I work on my client's work. So I stay a, a little bit behind or I go in a little early in the morning or I come in on a weekend and I work on my own projects to make sure that I keep, you know, working for me as well as, as working for other people. Um, and this was one of the projects where I, I really enjoyed trying to figure out a, a way to incorporate a little bit of steampunk, uh, uh, cyberpunk, not steampunk, Jesus, two completely different things cyberpunk into this um this theme that that they're all they kind of set in that world so i wanted to bring in the the rims of the bases to paint those names of all of the different characters uh because i really wanted to bring each and every individual model since it's a such a small gang to life and then lastly uh i'm working on a client's uh project uh uh who uh, commissioned me to do a very large uh, 
uh, Adepta Sororitas Sisters of Battle army, uh, where I'm uh, using uh, light gray and black and magenta as a color scheme for it, uh, which was very exciting. I, I love magenta. It's one of my favorite colors. Uh, as you can see on the rim of the bases are magenta <laughs> or the, the name uh, tag there. Uh, but yeah, so so those are the things that I'm working on. So again, um, the, 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 the pro sorry, can you, can you repeat the question again? The second question. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. We, we, we kind of got <laughs> sidetracked. That's all good. Yeah. So, all right, so we, we know what you're working on now. I want to yeah. know, I want to know where to get inspiration from. And, and right. I ask you this because, okay, let's say um, I, I recently just bought the Lumineth Realm Lords. Mm -hmm. or I just bought Gargans, or there's a battle box that comes for Christmas, or uh, I'm seeing the new uh, Necrons or Space Marines that just got announced at the, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the new ninth edition, right? Let's say I want to start a new project, whatever it might be, old models, new models, doesn't matter. Yeah. Where do I get inspiration from to, to bring my army to life? Where do you find your inspiration? I, I really try to find inspiration from, from a, a couple of different sources. And uh, one of the major ones is color. I am a sucker for color. My last year at, uh, of my, my degree in art, I tried to study only color. That was all I did was just look at different colors, how they interact with each other, what they do, and, and play around with it as much as I possibly could in an academic setting. And I still try to always play with color and see what works with what. What can I pair to make something really fun and vibrant or give a feeling? Uh, the second thing that I draw a lot of inspiration from is books. Uh, and that's especially lore from, you know, Age of Sigmar or Worm of 40,000 or Necromunda or things like that. And really, engage a little bit with these writers that are are spending their you know working hours just punching out uh imagination on paper for us to digest and really get a sense for who are these characters what is this chapter what is this army what are these realms uh what happens there and then that i let that not define what i see and how i how i interact with my models but i i, I try to let that um, be the beginning of a snowball, sort of let that run me into different directions that I might like to do. Um, and, and the, and, and as for example, we can get the, uh, Nurgle army, uh, up here, um, as an example, because that was a project where I took a lot of inspiration from, um, H of Sigmar lore and specifically from the play garden, um, uh, that that's a it's a phenomenal book. I believe it's written by C. J. Werner, but let's let's, let's assume that let's let's yeah. assume that one. If I, if I not, it's probably Josh Reynolds, but it's probably yeah. C. J. It's probably C. J. Yeah, I I think so, but I apologize if that's not the case, C. J. Or, or whoever wrote the book. It was a phenomenal book, anyways. And and there are these moments where there's this this they're describing these stormcasts or in this realm of Nurgle, right? That they're just treading through this sludge of, of, of just postural and grossness. And instead of, as the Nurgle army, right, is, is based off of a greenish kind of feel, right? You, you got the greenish skin on, on the, on the plague bearers and you got a lot of, you know, kind of greenish skin. I didn't want to make green bases because then you're just mm. putting green on top of green. So um, what I wanted to do was for something to enhance that green instead, right? And, and we're going to get into complementary colors later, but red is a complementary color of green. Um, so that was a natural way to think, well, not only is the color here working to, to balance out and, and kind of run the, the, the concept of this basing for this army, but also blood is, uh, you know, very, very... Um, a, a, a pool of infestation for diseases and things like that. So, so it kind of works with the concept too, that it's a, it's a pool of blood. And I know many people go and say corn, that's corn, right? But who, who's to say that corn has the, the sort of the only one who can um, use blood in their, in their theme and lore, right? So 
I, I wanted to try to not let things define what I wanted to do, but I wanted to, to run with something that would be a little different, uh, but that would also emphasize the things that I wanted to, to stand out, which are the green and plague-ridden Nurgles, right? It's, I, I just want to pause you there on a, on a thing, and, and, and it's very fascinating that you brought it up, mm -hmm. is that we often get stuck with colors, and I think we have an association of colors to armies. So when I went, you know, and, and people playing at home or people playing on the podcast can close their eyes at this particular point, and, you know, if I said to you what color is Stormcast, I bet you most people would say gold. Right. If I said to you what color is Zench, you say blue. Well, Nurgle, green. Uh, you know, Slanesh, pink. You know, if I talked about, you know, th th there's certain armies that are really pigeonholed and boxed into particular colors. Right. And that, that can be a limitation to what you're talking about here. And, yes. you know, I, I love that you mentioned you wanted to reclaim red and because you don't think of red and you might think of it as a minor color with Nurgle. But actually, it's almost like, and I, I remember, I think it was I was in Doug 2 Plus Tufts chat um not long ago and someone in the chat had mentioned about you know uh painting their corn dragon blue and had seen some negative feedback people were not happy with uh corn dragon being blue because corn is red like that that's one plus one equals two not allowed to use any other color you could use right. a variation of red <laughs> but but, yeah. but you can't move out of red but then the question asked is well what if this corn was sitting somewhere? Maybe this corn, for example, was a part of the ever winter and, you know, got was, was, you know, sitting in the snow, sitting in, you know, the ice caps, wherever it might be. And they've adapted to the, the environment and through that evolution or whether, you know, the, the, the magical and the demon energies actually then kind of almost make them a bit chameleon like to the environment that their skin turned blue as opposed to red right or they're or they're more icy you know their their energy kind of absorbed ice and that's why they're a, a blue as opposed to a red Who, who's there to tell me that i can't do that and who can tell me in the entire mortal realms that every single corn blood letter for example is red yeah and i think that that in itself is limit uh, is opens you up like you've you know you've got it out of jail yeah. it's like wait a second i'm not restricted to a color yep no, I mean, I, I even when I, when I see comments like that, I don't even know how to respond because it just it's like putting handcuffs on your artistic, you know, expression. And if if painting Warhammer and war games is anything, it's your artistic expression. You get to do whatever you want to do, and nobody can come and tell you that it's wrong to do it that way. You know like I said before, some if you're competing in best army at a convention or Golden Demon or something, judges are going to be judges. Judges are going to have opinions. And in, if you want to make sure that you win, you need to know who the judges are so that you can make sure that you know what they like and don't like and make something that they are going to like. But that doesn't mean that you have to sacrifice your entire art artistic expression. But if you're just painting for you, and, and, and speaking of 2 Plus Tough, Doug, he just released a video saying, I'm not going to participate in Armies on Parade, and here's why. And he was talking about, you know, this is for me. This is not for anybody else. And if I start to paint for competitions, I'm starting to paint for someone else. And that's stressful. I don't want to be stressed. I want to do me, so I'm going to do me. Cool. I mean, more people should think that way. Yeah, I, look, you know, obviously we're, you know, for majority of people who are listening to this, they're not competition painters. They're not going for Golden Demon. Yeah. Um, so, you know, like, again, do what you want to do. Um, right. You know, and, and, you know, if you are going to share, you know, you do need to appreciate that uh, certain people do have different opinions. And I always find that, you know, sharing a story or a narrative or uh, the decision point, um, mm -hmm. hey, maybe you're colorblind. Maybe you can't see red. Like, right. like would make no sense painting painting your corn red if you can't see red any other places for inspiration because i i love that you've you know you've looked at the stories you've looked at um the, the colors and you're trying to think about you know you've got a bit of a vision kind of forming yeah uh yeah so here's another sort of uh, it's not specifically me coming up with these two examples uh of, of inspiration but it's something that i had to work with and I loved working with both of them. And, and these two concepts were taken from um, 
uh, books outside of Warhammer or movies outside of Warhammer or video games outside of Warhammer, something that isn't related to Warhammer or the other games that you might be playing, but you might love, right? So if we take up, for example, the Osiark Bone Reaper project that I did um, a while ago, and I'm still working on this project for this client, he wanted a army that felt like White Walkers from Game of Thrones or Drogars, don't judge me on my pronunciation here, uh, from Skyrim. So he had played the game, he'd watched the show, and he was really into that concept for Ozark Bone Reaper. So that gave me that challenge to bring in, okay, so so for example, what do I, how do I, so the White Walkers are blue, but then you got the dead people and they are not blue. So how do you tie that together? How do you make that into something? So I just kind of went off with that concept and said, the leaders in this army are going to have blue bone and blue skin. That's just what I'm going to do. And, um, and then you have um, the regular sort of soldiers. They're painted in a cold bone. So I mixed in some blue into Ushapti bone, a little bit of very drab brown into Ushapti bone. Um, and uh, do, do you by the, any chance have that Osiak bone reaper picture? Um, oh, I, ju sure. I just changed. I just changed the picture to the color wheel. Oh All right. man! All right, All right. so, so let's, All right. All right. All right. let's let's roll with it. Let's roll with it. Here we go. Uh, so, how, how, how about I promise the chat that uh, I will bring up the Osiak Bone Reaper picture after we go through color wheel? Because I think this is really important to understand, folks. Is that okay? I learned this when I was in high school. Uh, I was an arts major. Um, I actually studied theatre at university. That was my major. Don't judge me. But uh, I, I, I was a very artistic person and I remember being introduced to the color wheel. And it's something that I keep coming back to all the time in my miniature painting. And the reason I do that is because I think about, and Oscar's gonna explain this a lot better than I will, but you've got these, these colors here and the colors you'll have complementary colors and you'll have col colors that will contrast. And when I'm thinking about the types of colors that I want to bring into my army and I've got, you know, Perkins has taught, uh, I'll bring up a question from Perkins in a minute. It, it, you know, they've asked about, you know, using gray as the, as the starting point. So it's almost like, well, then, you know, if I pick a color and let's say it is a red corn, how do I, how do I make my miniature stand out? And to your point before Oscar about, I didn't want to have green bases for a Nurgle army that's already green. Well, then how do I choose a different color scheme that's either going to complement or contrast right. and bring the model to life and not blend it into the base. And it's the color wheel that brings me to my decision point. But I thought I'd bring it to you because you are clearly better explaining this. But it's something that I think for, for anyone who's thinking about colors and thinking about how do they bring a concept to life, this mm -hmm. is a good starting point. Right. Yeah. So so es essentially you, you, um, you have these three colors, the three primary colors, which is red, yellow, and blue. And, and you start off there, they don't have a single relationship to each other as primary colors. And then you got secondary colors, which is purple, orange, and green, right? So orange comes from mixing yellow and red, uh, green comes from yellow and blue, and then purple comes from red and blue. Uh, so the concept of uh, you know, complementary colors is that you pair the secondary color with a primary color that has no relationship to each other. So for example, you would have purple and yellow. So purple is made out of red and blue and yellow has nothing to do with it. So, so there's- purple, So purple and yellow are opposite each other here. If yes. I look, if I'm looking at purple and violets and you know, the yellows, it's, it's completely on the other end. Yeah, yeah. So this color wheel, it's a little bit spun to do that sort of diagonal, easy to recognize, um, what what works with what uh since it's a little bit shifted here but th that's the concept that i think keeping that at the back of your head means that you understand not just why something or you understand why something is a con complementary color because i think that's pretty important especially when you start getting into how you can utilize that on a more advanced level because you can make a, a, a if you want a striking color scheme right you take orange and blue boom i mean that's gonna look good you can not really mess that up too much. You know, you got a lot of, um, you know, football and hockey teams and things like that. that are using complementary colors in their 
in their color scheme for their players, right? Um, so, so, but but when you start getting into the more advanced part of the color wheel, you really want to start thinking. You have a blue, and the way that you're shading that blue may mean that you start incorporating a little bit of a, of, a, of an orange into that shade. Because what happens is that you start to really the, the, the orange will support the blue and bring up more blue to the eye because the orange uh, separates so much from the blue that it creates contrast. And yes, okay, this is this is a little bit better. Yeah, this, this is exactly right. So here you can draw even draw a diagonal uh, that goes, uh, so red just, on the opposite spectrum, you got green and orange, you got blue and, and so on. So this is this is great. Um, so so when you're when you're painting a color and you want to try to shade it down by using a little bit of complementary color, you get contrast. And the key thing to making miniatures look good is contrast. And there are many different ways of creating contrast. You got light to dark, so you got bright colors and dark colors. Right. So, for example, if we bring in the, the, the project that you are dying to start working on as soon as the models drop, right, the, the sort of more um, um, ashy, um, charcoal, black, dark gray skin tone for these gargants, if you start using too many dark colors for the clothing, then you lose that contrast that separates what skin and what's your clothing or the details or things or hair or things like that, right? So that means that by, by starting to separate things, and you can do that using color and complementary color specifically. Uh, so that's essentially why you want to think and use the color wheel as you're coming up with a concept for the army in terms of what colors am I supposed to use for this? So a perfect example, and I think, you know, um, I was talking to somebody about basing their eye and jaws. And um, I, I, they were the traditional, you know, yellow armor, green skin, iron jaws. And they were talking about basing. And, you know, for me, I think about where the iron jaws may come from. And I'm always drawn to the red, you know, the, um, is it Games Workshops, the iron, the Martian iron crust? I think it is that, that kind of mm -hmm. reddy brown yeah. type of basing. Yep. And I think about why I'm drawn to that. And you can see here that green and red are completely opposite each other. Because the iron jaws are using the yellow armor, the green, um, the green uh, skin. So if I was to use, I don't know, a blue basing or a green basing, it would look very much, you know, very very similar, right? I'm using very similar colors, and it may not stand out. But the red not only complements the model and it makes it look very distinctive of the base and the model, but it yeah. makes the greens and the yellows pop because it is such a contrast with the red. So. Yeah. I think for me, that's why I'm drawn. And obviously I'm not saying that iron jaws are restricted to that basically, right. <laughs> but, but it does like, that's the theory kind of coming into play here. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a, that's a great example exactly on how to not, how to use a product that's out there and that's available and it's easy to use to, to bring in a little bit of what we're talking about to enhance the models on the base, because you know, you, you, you got some people, you know, every once in a while you come across this army where the model is, you know, it's, it's good. It's nice. But then you see the basing, you're like, that guy loves basing. That's what he is into. Um, and the bases are so elaborate that the model kind of becomes part of the base and it just sort of disappears into the base. When you're, when you're doing an army, oftentimes you are more interested. And I am always interested in this because basing is fun, but it's not the reason why I, you know, paint the models. Um, I always try to make sure that the base enhances the model at every turn so that the base functions as a support making you drawn to the army in itself and the models on top of it um in, in and 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 using these different now as you said you're not locked to using complementary colors in this way but even going towards an orange type sand you know what orange is kind of like on the brownish spectrum of things right so using that kind of color, you're you're kind of leaning towards that way, and you're not going all the way over to red, 
but but that lean can be a good way to also make sure that you emphasize the models. But in addition to that, you want to make sure that you also use if your if your if your orcs are painted with a dark skin tone, like you're saying, you go for black orcs, right? So they're very dark green. Then you want to make sure you have a light base and maybe light armor on top of that, so that there's a there, there's like an overlapping of how you place the colors. I always say you want to have dark color, light color, dark color, light color, dark, you know, and, and so on. And that way you make sure you separate all the different layers and all the different parts of the sculpt uh, uh, so that it's easy for the viewer to recognize what's what, even at an arm's length, because that's what we're commonly seeing armies at, right? It's arm's length. And that's where you need to start thinking and planning your concepts. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. I think, you know, thinking about what a model might look like really close up, what it might look like, you know, as an opponent from the other side of the table and, you know, like just having a look at how you can make sure that your model stands out. Yeah. Um, for me, you know, I'm thinking about this and I think about how do I incorporate this into my army and it might come down to what is my primary colour and it might be my model is mostly a skin colour. So I'm thinking demons, for example, which are mostly skin. So then I'm thinking about how do I use complementary colours and if I remember, and, I, and I'll go back to this, but your Nurgle army, you know, you had a lot of greens, but you also used a lot of purples and violets, mm -hmm. which you can see uh, uh, on the, the cool side. And you, we probably didn't even talk about that as well, is you can kind of split the wheel and you've got these cool colours and you've got these warm colours as well yeah. that kind of, um, again, kind of like bring up the emotion, but also kind of like if you've got too much cool, you might want to, you know, mm -hmm. bring a bit of pop with warm. So... Right. Yeah, so so a good example, as you said there, I'm using a lot of violets and magentas, especially on the on the on the uh, source and the wounds and all that stuff, because that's naturally where we go. You know, a wound is like that sort of, uh, you know, if it's more corrupted, it starts going towards like a blackish purple color. Um, so here's another way that I utilize the complementary colors in that way. So when I painted the skin tones on the blightkins. Um, instead of starting to go up towards more of a of a tan uh, sort of style and sort of walk towards the brown, so more of an orange kind of uh, uh, tint, I actually went more towards the yellow side of the spectrum. Uh, so I actually mixed in a very bright yellow into the skin tone as I kept highlighting up, and that way it started in, and that again it's not it's not using the, the color wheel and the complementary colors in an obvious way where you're like okay we got purple now put a primary yellow on top of that it's like the the small ways that you incorporate a color and mix it in to and anybody who's seen my tutorials knows that mixing is the way i do my shit because it's really fun and it, it, it opens up a new world to where you're not restricted to paint pots anymore but mixing in those small little colors just makes thing things pop a little bit more. It makes things richer. It makes things come to life in a way that I think if you're just going based on one, um, um, uh, you know, one type of of, of 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 color part of the wheel, you you just won't get. And if you stick to paint pots, you won't get it either. And that's where you see you do start to see some miniature painters. All they do is they use their primary colors and they'll just mix them on their wet palette. Um, we'll talk about wet palette soon, so we'll talk about yes. tools that you might need. And uh, I might have just blown some people's like, what is a wet palette? So I don't want to go, go too deep there. But, you know, a, a simple execution that I've used uh, with this kind of methodology is my goblins are green, uh, as you would expect a goblin or a moon clan grot or a gloom splat gets to be. But I've got on their little nose a bit of red. Um, yeah. It's not like mm -hmm. Mephiston red, but it's a bit of like a uh, a red glaze or a little bit of red, and it kind of brings in the warmth of this glowing nose that might be uh, a bit upset, or you know, it, and it it really makes them pop. Right. Um, but then I've also seen people, and I've done it in the past as well, uh, especially like undead type of flesh, where you incorporate a bit of like a purple or a a mm -hmm. blue wash to kind of bring the um, the skin color down a little bit because you've got these hues of blues and purples uh, as opposed to this uh, lively uh, reds that are normally in a warm kind of skin and you don't want to kind of go down the pallid witch flesh too much and have like just dead flesh. It's like it kind of brings a little middle. So, yeah. 
No, no, absolutely. And I mean, if if you look at our faces, speaking to the to the goblin, I mean, the ears and the nose and the cheeks, you know, th they are naturally have a little bit more red. And 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 I think when you start putting in a little bit of that kind of color play into the models, you give them life. You give them the feel that something is pumping in those models. And it's such a small little thing to do. And it's such an easy, like you said, it's just a little bit of like that red glaze. I still have a little bit of that uh, blood letter glaze, the red left, which yeah, I still, love. I've still got some. It's, it's... Yeah, it's like as soon as that's out, I'm going to be so pissed. Uh, <laughs> but um, but yeah, so, so, so bringing that in a little bit is definitely going to help to make, uh, uh, you know, it, it adds in a little bit more different type of color into it and it makes it more vibrant and fun. And, and so, so yeah, it's a really good point. And when it comes to dead flesh, I mean, when I, when I really try to paint dead flesh, I try to use all of the different colors because it also depends on how they die. Right. So that the, I envisioned that the Blykins are to some extent kind of like a lot of parts of their bodies are just straight up dead. They're just hanging there. You know, their body, their, their body is like completely shutting down. Yeah. And 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 the, the the lore, and this might be inaccurate to the way that some people describe it, but this is my interpretation: is that you know they are just kind of they, they are zombies to some extent, but they're powered by this magical deity that just fuels them with the disease that makes them zombie-like. And and if you cut into their belly, it's just it just digs into the flesh and they don't feel a thing you know what i mean so it's 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 also that sort of cycle of of like well how far along are these pieces because it's a drawn out you know process to 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 make things die so you either go for straight up dead and cold and buried and you know or you go for something that's like almost there or part there uh can also be a, a good way to bring in even more colors like magentas and like you said, always purples and blue are cold, like so they 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 chill down the body a little bit, but some parts of the body may have still have some sort of circulation of blood or something that keeps that part alive and moving. So I guess for me, if I go back to the the original question and, and it ties again, it ties in really nicely with with the color wheel, is where do I get inspiration from? So you mentioned stories. Um, mm -hmm. I like to I like to look at the path that's already wa been walked. Uh, so I'll go into Google Images, Pinterest, Instagram to see what other people have done. And maybe, you know, Lumineth Realm Lords, very few people have painted it. But other people have painted similar styles. If yeah. I want to think about oh, what, is, what does Lumineth look like that's purple? I haven't seen any examples of purple Lumineth. I, I have, but just imagine I hadn't. Um, I would go in and see, well, what, what, what does purple miniatures look like? And what does purple armor look like? Is there any yeah. Iron Jaws that are purple? Is there any Cities of Sigma that are purple? Um Phoenix Guard are close to Lumineth, so maybe what does the Phoenix Guard look like? Um, and I start to kind of get ideas and, and you know, I could test it myself. I could go buy a kit and paint it myself and kind of see. Uh, I remember watching a video not long ago from Goobertown where he had kind of done, I think he did a Slaves to Darkness model. I think he did like a Chaos Warrior in like 20-odd colours just to see what a Chaos Warrior looks like as a yellow, an orange, a purple, a green, a blue. And you could kind of choose a color palette from there or look what other people have done. Yeah. And if they, ha if they have walked your path, cool. Collect those, grab them, save them in a file, put them on Pinterest, uh, download them on your computer as a reference. You know, there's a lot of inspiration you can draw from the stories, but also just from, from Google images themselves and obviously your battle tomes as well. Or it could be, I, I, I like to ask myself, what does this look like? So I mentioned the Gargans. I said to myself, what does Gargans look like if they were in Akshi? But then you could yep. ask yourself, what does a Gargant look like in Shaiish or Shimon? Yep. And if we know, you know, the, the realm of metal, for example, how would it, and I'm looking at my Gargant, I'm looking at this Gargant and I'm thinking, if you were from the realm of metal, what would you look like? What is different to you? Would you look like this? And I think about the environment. I think about the armies that are around it. I think about maybe where in, where in the mortal realms. Like if it is in Akshi, is there a, a part of the map 
Uh, yeah. Is it close to the fire slayers? Is it uh, hiding from the fire slayers? Is it somewhere else? And what has it done to them? Right. Maybe maybe they got inspiration from the um, from the fire slayers, and they're more Viking. So, yeah. what does a Viking gargant look like? <laughs> um, but then, what does it look like if it was all? Me- what if it was m- metal in its body? Maybe it's not skin; it's it's metal, right? right. Uh, like liquid metal. Maybe like it's like Colossus from X Men. Yeah. What does that look like? And then you kind of start thinking to yourself, and you're like, well. I then might bring in some parts. I might bring in some painting techniques. I might bring in some things that help me bring this idea to life. And I think by having an idea in your mind, and it may not be concrete, it will help you, help guide you down the rabbit hole. Right. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, just just shooting the, uh, the idea out there, like when you were talking about the realm of metal and gargants, um, the idea that kind of popped into my head was, uh, my approach to that would probably not to paint the f- whole body in metal metallic colors and do it that way because the way that and my opinion again uh the way that i see it is that if someone's made out of metal they don't necessarily need clothing um but that's my interpretation of it um i would probably try to find little rocks and things like that glue them on there use a little green stuff to make them look like they're coming out of the skin and paint those metal because that way you're you're maintaining that sort of um uh organic sculpt that because they're sculpted to be organic they're not sculpted to be metal necessarily the 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 vision that the sculptor had wasn't necessarily metal doesn't limit you but it, it gives the opportunity to 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 nod a little bit at the sculptor and say okay I'm going to take this spin on you. I'm going to change the sculpt a little bit to work with my concept, but I'm still giving a little bit of homage to the, the person that did the work for the model that, that I'm, that I'm working on, you know? Um, but, but that's just essentially the way that I go down that sort of, yeah, runway. Yeah. And, and, and I, I threw that up just merely as a, mm-hmm. a as yeah. an idea. It's certainly one that I'm not exploring, but I think it comes back to the what if, yeah, you know, exactly. There are, sto- there are stories that, you know, the cities of Sigma or the Freaks, there are humans that live, not cities of Sigma, but there are humans that live in partnership with the undead in Shaiish. Mm-hmm. You know, they live with the ancestors. Yeah. Do they look like cities of Sigma or mm-hmm. are they more undead like? And right. if they are living like undead, maybe the, the living models um, wear the armor of their ancestors, which is going to be beaten, which is going to be rusty, which is going to be uh, not not perfect so i bring that to life through maybe corrosion maybe you know yes scratching up the model um because again the the idea is not a, a free guild guard but actually it is something that is more deathly um, yeah yeah no example exactly i i love the the concept that you're that you're bringing up right now it's such a cool idea to have the armor be weathered and and even you might also think that the that the aging of these people, they age, they look to the, to the look of it, they age much faster. So maybe they are look more older and their hair is much longer and everything is just sort of sped up. And the only thing that keeps them alive at a regular rate is magic, right? So you have like everything organic, whether it's metallic or trees or something like that, just ages much faster. That's a, that's a brilliant concept, man. I, I almost would steal something like that for uh, one of my projects, man. <laughs> but like, you know, like, but, but like if I had like these humans, uh, like for example, right. And um, they live with their ancestors and they u- are using their ancestors weapons. You know, a simple way that I can bring that to life that I'm thinking about is that I imagine a hundred, 200, 500 year old armor is not shiny. It doesn't look right. new. So maybe I don't use like null oil and I use gloss paints, but I'm actually kind of bringing it down and I'm trying to dull it down as much as possible. And it's dirty and mm-hmm. it's, you know, might have holes in it. Like I use like a little pin vice and kind of drill holes to, to, to um, show off examples of uh, where in battle, yes. but obviously someone's died, right? People have probably died in battle wearing this armor. So how do I bring that to the table? And I don't want to kind of get stuck too much on this concept, but I think where I want to show you is, is how do I bring this idea to life? Um, I always had this idea of making a realm of metal sylvaneth. And I wanted to paint my trees as golds and silvers and bronze. Cool. And they are more 
like what you would see at, I don't know, a construction site than it would be actually a forest. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like, how do you bring that to life? And again, it just kind of opens up so many ideas. And another example I brought up on here on the screen, folks, is uh, your Auric version of a Gargants. And boy, oh boy, this is cool. <laughs> Uh, yeah, th this th these are for two different armies uh, that that I themed them to. So the one on the left is uh, for my um, uh, Ma tribe army, where I, I painted the armor to be very rusty, and you know they're they're using all of these and and just ogres in general uses these breastplates and things like that. So there's a lot of that kind of style. So I resculpted the head uh, of the guardian to look like an orc. Uh, because that's how I do my Ma tribe. I, I substitute the head for uh, orc knobs from 40k. I just did a simple head swap, and that's all I did with it. Uh, doesn't have to be anything, you know, complex in order to to make a, a a change, a theme, a little bit. So when when I wanted to do a gargant, that was a natural thing to do was to just keep that theme running. I didn't change much on that Gargan at all. The pose is all the same that they come with, the weapons all the same, the hands are all the same, the pants, etc. It's just the head. And then I sculpted one of those helmets that uh, you see on the, what are they called? Uh, not lead belchers, the iron guts. They have those helmets on. So I just kind of held one of those heads in front of me. And as I sculpted, I just try to copy as best as I can, just at a, at a larger scale. Um, and the one on the left, uh, on the right, sorry, is the is the one that I did for my Iron Jaws army, which was um, so I used Gorgon grunt up plates and um, and sort of the the I think the the thing that sits by his jaw is the top part that sits on the Gorgrunta's head. Uh, it's that for that leader. So I just tipped it upside down and just glued those things together with a little bit of green stuff and a little bit of filing and and just smacked it on there. And then the you know, shoulder plates and all that stuff is just part of that. And then I and then I did a sword because I didn't feel like the the iron jaws. They don't bring a club, they bring blades. They want that you know smashing, spiky metallic things, right? So so I wanted to just do a sword that um, made it feel like it was part of the same army in terms of weaponry too. And then those little uh, tassels that sits are also from the Gore Grunt uh, bit bit box um to to give him a little bit of flair up there and because they like to pimp him i guess <laughs> and i think that 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 really helps right you got this idea it's like i want to bring my gargant into and and i, and I keep referring to gargants as well because uh, the sons of behemoth are going to have the mercenary rule where there is going to be a named character for each by by the looks of it one gargant that will be available to all of the different armies so we've seen yes. the kraken eater will be available to order and destruction, death, destruction, destruction, I think it was. I think it was order and destruction. Maybe. It was and, either death or destruction. I, I agree with you there, but I don't remember either. But, yeah, whatever, whatever it is, right, the Kraken Eater yeah. is um, is order and destruction, for example. So why why would your army as a as a, an Ideneth Deepkin have a Kraken Eater? And maybe that is because that this Kraken Eater is so close to the, the sea. It's hunting Kraken, for example. It's hunting fish. And maybe it's something you've enslaved. Maybe it's something that is helping you uh, uh, scare the, the villagers and kind of bring them to the ocean. And that's where, you know, your deep kin are able to steal the souls of the, um, of the, the cities. But then what does it look like um, as a fire slayer? And maybe it's got more fire slayer aesthetics, kind of very similar to what you've done here in it. And 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 maybe you not you can't reduce the range, so it's a little stocky, stocky naked dwarf. But you bring in the oranges, you bring in mm -hmm. the crazy hair, you bring in maybe you engrave some ruins into uh ru ruins, sorry, into the body to um to replicate the ergold. Yeah. Um I think again, it's almost like grabbing this little miniature and saying, what would this look like? as a KO. And if it was a part of KO, what would KO do to this model? And how would I tech up this yeah. target? And that's when it's like, cool, I can then start looking at the GW range. I can look at third party providers because there are companies out there that make bits, uh, resin bits purely for third party, you know, miniatures. 
I might green stuff stuff. I might pull things from other kits. Uh, you know, you mentioned, for example, grabbing some stuff from the Gore Grunters. All of a sudden, this, the, the, the pieces start to fall into place mm -hmm. because I've got this reference point is what does a Gargant look like when it's KO'd? What does right. it look like when it's, when it's Stormcast? And maybe then I pull out, I don't know, Dracoline or uh, Star Drake armor or do something. And I'm, I'm now down a rabbit hole making hey. the best. I mean, that, that, that's, the rabbit hole is oftentimes where I find my best projects. You know, it, it, it's one of those things. I think the, 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 the biggest disservice that you can do to yourself when you're trying to theme an army is to come up with one concept and then run with that concept in the exact thing that you thought of first like the best thing to do is to to get together with a buddy and then throw spaghetti at him and see what sticks on his forehead you know um i have friends that i try to do that to all the time and it's a great tool to make things not the like going in one lane like because oftentimes when you're doing things by yourself it's like a one train running in one direction and you have your way of doing things bringing in someone else that can say oh what if you did this what if you did that can be a way to just get that one idea that then starts to go in a completely different direction and takes you to exactly what you were saying the rabbit hole of ideas of what you can do yeah yeah well, i've never started an army and finished an army the same way i planned it out Right. Um, and anyone who's thinking about armies on parade, you know, I start off with a concept or an idea. I'm like, what does what does the house of my my squid? And I'm thinking about doing armies on parade, and I'm thinking about doing it um, for my squigs. Um, I was focused on a Gargant display board for for CanCon, which is you know a massive event. But unfortunately, that's been cancelled. So I'm thinking maybe I'm going to do a, a Jaws of Mork board. And I'm like, well, what does this look like? And and then kind of I, I go down a rabbit hole. And I just want to bring a comment that Hannah has mentioned, which I, I truly love. Uh, partially, I don't agree with it because she said that she do she doesn't think that she's good at converting rubbish. Everyone's great at everything. Don't uh, don't compare yourself to others. But I do love the fact that we've talked about. Um, I love telling a story by painting an army via their bases and the color scheme, mm. and it kind of ties in nicely to per what Perkins said around you know the the story that you can tell with basing, and then yes. you bring in battle damage you bring in you know parts of an epic story mm. um you, you bring in um you know does, does is your army my, but your cities of sigma for example it's it's close to my heart is my cities of sigma marching out of the castle in preparation to defend the battle or go to fight is it in the middle of the battle and you know maybe and i think i think it was vincent and, and vince and sam lens were talking about this in their episode they were talking about their army is actually a, a, an aggressor in mm -hmm. someone else's realm. Yeah. So it's not that my basing is the home base, but rather maybe my army is in the realm of death. And although my army doesn't live in the realm of death, it's a, I don't know, it's a hallow heart army based in, in Akshi. Actually, it is in the realm of death because it's trying to uh, reclaim some artifacts that Nagash and friends had stolen from the Storm Vault. And that's yeah. why I'm using the purples and I'm using the death theme, not because that's where they're based, but rather that's the the fight or the campaign or what they're doing. And right. then it opens up all this story and it's like, well, cool. Well, uh, what artifacts have they captured? What battles have they won? Um, how do I represent that in the model? And there's a rabbit hole. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think I think Hannah had a, a really good point in the way that you would kind of start off with, a a, a, a a sort of base and the color scheme and then start to like work your story into the way that you're you're you're, you're sort of adding on another layer and another layer and another layer and that really is what kind of brings armies to life i think is when people you know as a commission painter I, sometimes i i do get stuck in this place where there's a theme i have to paint the army this is how much money i'm getting paid Thus, this is the amount of time that I put into the army and that's it. You know, like I, I can't, if I start to put in my passion into every single project, I'm going to go bankrupt. Um, so it, it does go back to that point where your personal project is your expression, your artistic expression. And the only thing that stands in between you getting to that level where you're like, wow, I, 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 
peaked. I made an army that I never thought I could do is essentially you and your time that you have to put in on that project and, and, and the willingness you are, you have to, to sort of explore different ideas and uh, listen to other people on, and, and on what they're saying on their YouTube tutorials or search for that, that technique that you feel like it suits your project, right? If you, like we said earlier, magic, well, OSL might be for you. Um, it, it's all, it's all there, you know, yeah. it, it, it's just, you, you gotta, you gotta find it and you gotta search for it and you gotta be willing to scrap an idea to find something different that you feel better about. I, I like to think of your idea as like your true North on the compass. It's, it's, it, you know, when, when you are at sea or whether you are um, walking through the bush, uh, you will come up across paths that will take you on random spots but as long as you're following the compass of your true north and getting to your destination, it doesn't matter the path that you take. And it reminds me, I'll bring up one more idea maybe that will help people, uh, and then I want to kind of get into some other questions, is um, you might be able to see behind me, you might not be able to see behind me, that I had messed up a, uh, a Celestine Prime, a Stormcast Eternal Celestine Prime, and I had stolen the big swirl from its base, and I put it on top of a Hurricanum because I wanted mm. the Hurricanum to to show off like drawing the magical energy. But where I say I stuffed up is because I now don't have a hurry. I now don't have a swirl for my prime. Mm. And I'm like, do I buy another prime? No, I don't want to buy another prime. But I had, I eventually, I'm like, well, how do I build this model out? Because it's weird. It's just like two little cloths, like toilet paper rolls, and then this big <laughs> model at the top. And I'm like, right. what do I do with this? How do I tell a story? And, and the story that I, I, I'm starting to build in my mind and I'm starting to explore is maybe it's not him flying up, but rather him crashing down. And mm. for anyone who's seen like a superhero movie where, I don't know, Iron Man crashes into the sky, he creates a, from the sky into the ground, he creates a, a crater. You know, things kind of pop up and dust and um, earth kind of explodes, similar to the Everblaze Comet, you know, kind of like this earth crust kind of cr is mm -hmm. created by the energy from him dropping. And I'm like, maybe that's a way I can get around uh, not having the swirl. So how do I do that? Well, I've got to build up the base around it and I'm looking at hot glue. I'm looking at, you know, gravel and I'm able to build up a base around it and also mitigate the fact that I've already used my swirl. So I'm actually using that to my advantage and I'm telling a story mm -hmm. that the prime has come down from the sky yeah. ready, to, ready to kick some ass. Yeah, no, it's, that's a great example of, of having a problem and then try to figure out how to solve that problem. And that takes you on to a, to a new kind of uh, 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 techniques and venture that you probably didn't expect to end up on, but it teaches you things on how to solve problems in the future. And that's, that's essentially, in my opinion, what art is. It's about solving problems. And, and that's what Abby is on Parade is. That yep. is what miniature wargaming is. It's not about – and that's where I um, I politely challenged Doug in his chats and I'd said, you know, I don't see building uh, a display board as a competition, but rather it's a personal challenge to myself and it forces me to look at new techniques and tools with a goal in mind but I'm competing against myself. Right. And this is where I, I look at this and go, well, how do I do this? And I think that's where I'm like, how do I fix this base? How do right. I bring in a, a, appropriate colors? You know, you've got, I brought up another example of yours here with your fire slayers and, and I'll let you share your story, but this is very untraditional when it comes to fire slayers. I don't associate greens and browns. And I know you've got something modeled here and I won't ruin Christmas for you, but this to me tells a, a story for fire slayers that I don't think I don't think I've ever seen done <laughs> in anyone else's models, and I would actually be more tempted to play fire slayers based off this because yeah. it's not just a bunch of naked naked angry dwarves. Right. Yeah. Th this is another commission that I uh, uh, made for a, uh, a a local player here in in, in Richmond, Virginia, and a, and a friend of mine, Travis. Um, his idea was Highlander Braveheart. And and he had this idea, what what if we what if we sculpt kilts? And I'm thinking to myself, all right, let's 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 sculpt some kilts. And uh and it ended up being, I think, I mean a Fire Slayer army, what are we talking? Shy of a hundred models, individually sculpted kilts, and then 
paint freehanding the pattern on shy of a hundred models. Each individual model has like 20 squares on them, if not more. And then L highlight each individual square. The point that I'm trying to make here to some extent, I think, is you need to know how much time you have to get into a project. That was definitely one of the lessons I learned doing my Stormcast Army. It was a lesson I learned on this project is, do you have the time to do this? And if you feel like you do, what is your time limit? How many hours do you think this is going to take? And are you going to be able to play this in the next 10 years? Because if you only like to play fully painted or take it to a tournament that requires painted, you know, your concept have to reflect the way and the speed that you want it done. Um, but yeah, so, so this project essentially is, is instead of thinking of the traditional fire, I had to try to incorporate something that felt like it worked with the Highlander style, the, the sort of Braveheart, the close to nature. It's a lot of green. You know, he wanted the basis to represent you know, a sense of Scotland and, and that kind of lush uh, uh, field of greens and flowers. So I decided to, to take the fire stuff and make it into Mother Nature Earth magic. Uh, so for this army, and I, I should have gotten the endless spells up here and the forge, uh, but you can find them on my Instagram, on my website, www.oscarlars.com, and you can look them up uh, now or whenever you have time for it. But Maybe not now, right? Maybe right. after the episode. <laughs> well, maybe people can multitask. I don't know. But anyway, so yeah, so you can, uh, you can um, find these, um, uh, uh, you know, nuggets that you're starting to, you, you start off at one end and like you say, you go a rabbit hole and you try to justify why things work and why things doesn't work. You know, when I'm thinking lush green nature, I'm thinking fire, you know, maybe not the best of friends, you know, yeah. um, you know, as, as, as we, we have seen, especially of late. Um, so changing that concept really does help to, uh, uh, put the lore on its end and bringing something unique that you just pump it full with. And then if we remember the, the color wheel that I'm not going to bring up, but if we remember the color wheel, green is opposite reds and yellows. So you can see that, you know, this is the opposite of what fire slayers are. Fire slayers are very orange, very <laughs> red traditionally, but we've got a dominant green with a complementary yellow, complementary orange, complementary red. One quick, one final question is kind of coming up in the chat a few times here, mm -hmm. and um, uh, I wanted to talk about neutral colors. Like uh, it's probably not the term's probably not neutral colors, but like grays, blacks, and whites. And I'm seeing a mm -hmm. few people talking about, you know, let's say necrons, right? You know, necrons mm -hmm. uh, in 40k, people are getting really excited about. Um, maybe your army is mostly metallic metals. Yeah. Uh, or you, you are like me painting your gargants in a gray skin tone and gargant skin is dominating the model. What are your thoughts on using your primary or your secondary colors? And um, does that create options because you don't have, um, you know, on the color wheel, uh, uh, you know, you don't have to worry about that too much because you're using a gray or a black or a white. Right, right. Um, I think the 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 com the way when you're starting to bring in, I mean, grays and lights. I mean, you're you're talking essentially about uh, a, a type of contrast, a light to dark. And when you're using, you know, metallics and you know, thinking about bronze and golds and stuff like that, you know, that then you started bringing in colors, but the metallics are uh, the sort of steels and the irons and the Th those kind of uh, 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 colors, then, then you are on a gray scale, right? Um, I think the, the most important thing is to know that if you're going for something like a dark metal, then you need something that is bright, that contrasts that. Uh, if you are on a spectrum of, you know, uh, what's called the achromatic colors, um, that's essentially white, black, and gray in between, then, then you're, then you have the opportunity to bring in a color that becomes the focal point of the color scheme. So Necrons, for example, very good example, especially the classic ones that just bulk on metal, right? 
and then you got some black and then you got that green and it's going to oh, time city you know like it, 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 it that is what we see we see the green glow we see those tubes and the pipes and the neons and all that stuff because that's what fuels them right and 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 so when you're painting colors like that you really need to be a little careful and and all, to, to to really work with the opportunity that you have to emphasize something uh, sometimes you can have a model and you, you put in some colors and the emphasis becomes weird and wrong and it might not be the right thing for you or for you know the the way that you wanted this army to go and then change it you know mm. it's always about changing and and being honest with yourself when you're painting because you try something it doesn't work well try something different and the the other key that i want to make to this point when we talk about color is when you bring in that color on top of say an achromatic color scheme or anywhere else for that matter when you're pairing colors together you need to remember that colors are not definitive so if you have a red and that specific red is paired with one color it looks one way and then you pair it with something that's very very different it looks a different way so colors are are, are changing depending on its relationship to colors around it and the lesson that i learned from finding this out when i was doing color theory at, at the university and i didn't know this before um so it, it's a great opportunity to learn something else when you go to school um what you <laughs> you you end up with uh, 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 finding out that if this red doesn't work, what about another red? There are so many different reds. There are corn reds. There are mephiston reds. There are evil sun scarlets. There are reds here. There are reds there. Maybe they're more brown. Maybe they're more purple. Maybe they're you know tinted to more of a pink. You, you know you got so many different ways of like getting those colors to where you want them to be that you wanted a red theme on top of that black and, and gray scheme well get the red that works for you not just the red that 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 feels like it's that primary mephiston red you know what i mean perfect segue into what i want to ask next uh but by, by the way that's brilliant and the only other point i'll, I'll quickly make here um, that I learned from Vince Venturello when I did his workshop at Adepticon. So I did a true metallic, a non-metallic metal class with Vince. And I, I remember Vince saying that um, armor, for example, metal, whether it's Necron, whether it's an armored warrior, whatever it might be, right? When you've ever had a mirror or you've ever had something that's shiny, you don't look, you don't see just metal. You right. see the reflection of where it's at, its environment. Is it reflecting the earth from the, the ground? Is it reflecting the blues from the sky? Right. What is around the model? And the metal isn't always truly metal. There is some type of reflection, and it gives you the opportunity to bring in reds or blues or browns uh, as a bit of a reflection point. So that's another thing that you might consider if you are trying to get, uh, you know, maybe you, know, you, you want your Necrons, for example. And I keep coming to Necrons because they're like 99% metal. Yeah. Um, you know, like you could bring in some variety in color because you're telling the story that actually they're fighting in uh, a green world, uh, I, I don't know, a Nurgle world, and, you know, you're getting greens and, and blues coming through and it kind of like, it's not dominant green, but you're getting little reflection points and it's kind of like tinting the metal um, because, as you said, the colors uh, interact with each other. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, when you're thinking about reflective uh, light and, and, and surfaces, I mean, that's that's definitely on the advanced scale of things. And, and if that's something that, that tickles your fancy, you definitely got to check out Richard Gray. Uh, I'm sure that every single person listening to this podcast is already following Richard Gray because he's just absolutely phenomenal painter but he does a lot of that he he brings in those reflections and 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 getting that metallic to look just like it's embedded into an environment uh so that's that's a really good point but i i do want to say to those people who who, who still want to stick to painting an army and, and and stuff like that is this is definitely above the sort of level that you need to produce this is definitely over course uh material right here um there's I no one earth I would be doing that with like a hundred warriors. Yeah, <laughs> no, 
I mean, I barely even do that on my things when I'm painting an army for 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 myself, like my Stormcast. I did not go. Th I did that a little bit, you know, but I definitely try to stay away from that because I, I peaked above like 600 hours on that army to get like the 2000 points ready. And that was like the low count model that I could do as well. So, you know, I, I, I stick away from it a little bit, but it's a great point though, because when you're thinking about colors, there's so many things that you can do and bring in just to get the colors in that you want to be in there and rationalize it in a way that you do uh, with say, for example, reflective light and, 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 and surfaces and things like that. Yeah. It's, it's a great point though. It's a fantastic And, and, and I wanted to bring up Tyler, Tyler uh, Pearson's point here, where he was talking about motivation to kind of get you through and finish the army. And I think um, that is a big trap that you have in this yeah. type of thing. And while it sounds wonderful to do objective source lighting, whether it's amazing to green stuff, everything, and you want to customize everything and you're going to, uh, you're going to, you know, edge highlight and you're going to do you know 50 million layers of paint per model and you know you're going to do these crazy cool bases there is that risk versus reward and there's also the the uh, how many hours do you have to put into a project uh when is done when, when is done good enough because you could yeah. always you can keep keep refining keep refining but then you kind of get burnt out and maybe you don't get your army feet finished or you're going to miss the hobby deadline because, you know, you are going to bring this army to a tournament. Or what often happens as well is people um, have this a brilliant idea and they don't play with their models and then they put them on the table and they realise yeah. the models don't interact that they wanted them to interact. And they've just, I don't want to say wasted, but now they've got to go in and get even more models yeah. and bring them up in line. So there's a, there, you know, maybe that's a question you need to ask yourself is how many dollars do you want to put into these projects? So, Oscar, your, your Gargan, for example, had bits from um, the Gore Grunters. Mm -hmm. Are you going to go chop up a bunch of Gore Grunters? Um, can you get those bits? How much are you willing to spend on those bits? Um, how much time can you invest or will you invest? And it's almost like um, making sure that you you can align your expectation to a reality. Otherwise, you'll yeah. be disappointed. You'll lose motivation when you realise your project's not moving as fast or you're not going to be able to complete it in that certain time and then you have this half finished project that um you know you, you're not proud of and you, you can't get it on the table and you know show it off like you really want to yeah no i i, I think this question is is absolutely um very very good um and and i want to kind of bring it back a little bit to that thing how do you finish an army how do you get to that point where you're like like you say here's the amount of time i have you know, I, I go to work, I come home, and then it's not every night that I want to sit down and spend, you know, four hours painting. Maybe the, the wife, the girlfriend, the boyfriend, the kids, whatever, is demanding a lot of your time, and you do, just don't have time. Maybe you've got other things that you need to do, take care of someone or whatever. And it makes it hard because life gets in the way, right? Um, what are some strategies to get you to be able to put in as little amount of time as possible on the project that you're doing and get the best result out of it. And Sam and and Vince touched on this a little bit in their in their um, uh, uh, conversation that they had. And I really recommend people going and watching that episode because it's a great way uh, to get some good feedback from two very very talented painters. Uh, the way that I like to set things up because as I work with this uh, painting army specifically is what I do for a living. This is something that I have to think about all the time because some p clients come to me and they say, I got a large budget and I want an awesome army and I don't necessarily care how much it costs. And then you got other people who say, this is the amount of money I have and I really want a good looking army. What can you do with this? And, you know, the the, the most important thing to make someone who, who, who comes and says, you know, I don't have a lot, lot of time or I don't have a lot of money to, to buy this project either way is colors and using the colors in a good way to map out your color scheme will make things look good from arm's length. And that's where we play. If you yeah. don't have time to do all of the details, don't do all of the details because it doesn't matter from that perspective. And, and Sam and Vince pointed out that, you know, there are some things that people look at, spend the time on that detail. 
and put your effort in there. The rest of the stuff you can just kind of do pretty simply. You know what I mean? So, so combining those two is have a good color scheme that you feel like works and everything kind of is defined. What, what like the, you can see the difference between the belts and the pouches. You can see the difference between the armor and the, and the, and the cloth and the stuff that you have. You can see the difference. If you look here on the skin, the pants, the loincloth, the tassels, the sword, the, the little mushrooms, the guy running on the base, you know, but by defining and, and sort of doing light, dark, light, dark as an example of contrast, but, you know, different colors and things like that, you, you, you really see from early on what things are as you stand in front of this army. And if you get up close, the details might not hold up, but who cares? If, if you need to play with the army, you want to get it painted, you want to get it painted good, spend the time on the things that matters. Yeah, that, that's brilliant. I mean, and, and I brought up your um, your grey water fastness as an example because, uh, it, it, you know, the, the Gargan, it, while it's an amazing model, it is a very big model and you don't you don't yeah. have as many models to deal. And that might be a consideration as well as how many models in your army. If you do more monsters, more big models, you've got less things to do, so you can yeah. spend more time on those models. But when we look at the Black Kings uh, from afar, just from this picture alone, not obviously zooming in, it is hard to see all that wonderful detail that you've put in. So, uh, it, it, and, and this is a question for you all to consider is how much effort and how much time and where do I get the biggest bang for buck yeah. so that I'm not wasting, not wasting my time, but I'm not spending too much time in areas that don't make the biggest impact. Yeah. So it's a consideration and obviously that's going to be different for everybody. Um, but just think about how you can bring that army to life and what parts of the model you can best draw that from yeah no absolutely absolutely to go back to basics and you know i wanted to know what are your what are your hobby essentials in your toolkit because i've got a million tools i've got so <laughs> many things and you know if i was getting started and i'm like cool i went and bought my citadel paints i've got my citadel brush i've got my my uh mold line scraper sure. i've got like, like, do I need to go buy an airbrush? Do I need to go and get green stuff roller, uh, texture basing things? Do I need, like, like, wh what is it that I need in my toolkit? Um, and then obviously what can I get later that's going to help me? Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely is a, a, a right tool for the job kind of situation. You don't need to have everything. Um, you just need to have the things that make sense for this army. So, you know, if you have a, a project in mind, maybe you, go and research a couple of tutorials online and you find out, okay, I want to do the bases this way. I want to do the models this way. I want to airbrush this. Well, then you need to have an airbrush. And, you know, there, there are different tools for the jobs that you're required to have, but you don't need to have an airbrush because a lot of the techniques that you do with an airbrush, you can do with a brush. Um, but, but, but at the same time, airbrush might speed things up. If you have you know, mon more money, less time, it might speed things up for you. If you have less money, more time, then go on the brush way might be a good way to do it. A lot of the tutorials that we do online tries to not focus on the airbrush because there's a lot of great tutorials on how to use an airbrush. So we don't necessarily feel like we need to fill a gap there. Uh, but but using that, the, the brush also helps people to use as few tools as possible to get the most out of their models. Um, so, so I think for me, it's, you know, I, I do this for a living. I have a company, my business pays for all of it. I have all the tools, you know, <laughs> there are a few things that I don't have somewhere in this studio. Uh, you know, I have a gazillion color shapers of different size and, 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 and shapes. I have so many different brushes. It's, you know, they barely even fit my me? cup, you know? What, what about me? Do I need to go double zero brushes? Do I need to, uh, like, do I need to go buy the entire GW paint range? Um, hell, do I even need to buy GW paints? I know some people have asked me about their advice on, you know, I wouldn't say breaking the mold, but, um, you know, we, we kind of get introduced to Citadel paints. Is there value going to Vallejo? Is there, uh, and I'm not sponsored by Vallejo, I, I, yeah, yeah. but I, I, do, I do really like their paints and they are a viable alternative. And, I, I, I still have my Citadel and yeah. I have my Vallejo. I think there's a place for both. Yeah. But there are things that I've picked up like uh, Medium. Um, I, I, my, my little mind blew when I found out that I could buy Medium 
by the gallon. And, um, <laughs> and like, I didn't have to go and buy these little tiny ass pots right. of medium. Yeah. And um, I remember painting terrain and I found out I could make, um, I could use inks and yeah. use inks, you know, acrylic inks. And uh, Vince, uh, there, was an, there was a tutorial by Vince Venturella uh, talking about um, the way he paints whites. Um, he'll create contrast and he'll smooth because one of the things I hate about whites is it can look very dusty at times. Yeah. Um, using using inks and especially inks in combination with the airbrush um, has a, a wonderful, I, I guess, um, after effect. It, it sinks in to the cracks in a different way that that washes, for example, doesn't do because that's not what it is, it is designed to do. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think the most important tools, because I think that, that what you're trying to get out of here is like, what do you need as a, as a hobby painter? What are the good things that you kind of must have? I can't dictate what you're going to pick up because again, you got to have the, the right tools for the job. But if you're just like a, a person who wants to paint uh, and you want to paint for fun or you want to paint an army and, you, you know, a wet palette is... I mean, it saves money, it saves time, it makes it way easier to keep layers smooth and clean. Wet palette is just good, you know, like, and, and there are some out there. I work with the red grass, you know, they are phenomenal. Uh, I've had, I, I supported the Kickstarter when they first came out and, uh, you know, I, I've had mine since then and it works perfectly. Anyways, I'm going to start touting the, the amazing tool that I love in my studio. But anyways, if, if, even, even if it's not, uh, even if you don't go buy a named uh, wet palette, you can make um, your own. Yeah. You can make your own simply yeah. with a bit like a little, like a little, um, like a Tupperware container, like those little yeah, tiny sponge. containers with a, with a wet sponge and a bit of uh, baking paper. Yeah, you can uh, even use uh, wet paper towels if you can't find sponges. Like there's there's tutorials on this on YouTube on how to make your own wet palette. You, you know, search for one, go find it, and make yourself a wet palette because it will change a lot of things. It may be, I've heard this, it may be a little bit of like a shift to, to, to go from a, a, a dry palette to a wet palette as it kind of feels different and the way that you need to continue to dilute your paints with water, you don't need to do that as much anymore. And sometimes I, I, I use a dry palette. So I have a yeah. ceramic dry palette yeah. uh, and being Australia, nothing is worse than being in summer, having to constantly uh, keep wetting my, yeah. my paint. Yeah. And the benefit, the benefit folks to a wet palette um, is a fact that if you are mixing up custom colors or if you're trying to blend, you know, uh, we talked about skin colors, having a bit of purple in them or a bit of red in them or blue in them, you know, you could make that and you could, uh, if, you, if you've got a wet palette uh, and you've got that wet sponge going on, the paint won't dry or it'll take a long time for it to dry. It might be yeah. days. So you could be coming back to all of your model skins and, you know, uh, Dan the Khan's talking about, you know, painting a large bunch of models in, you know, maybe a battle line. You can't complete 100 goblins in one sitting. Your wet palette would help you have those different colours um, for a long time. Yeah. So, And you have consistency, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, you know, just, just going off of that thing, it's also when we're talking about colour and, and, and things just pop in my head. So I'm sorry that it kind of goes back and forth and I hope that's not too distracting for people. But it's the creative when, process. Yeah, when you're, when you're painting a lot of models and you're going to have to, that you, you know, use different things. The way that I go about it is I try to block in all of the colors first, make sure that all of those are clean and then wash it and then start highlighting it. Because when you're, th there's nothing worse, right? And and even for me, I, I do this all the time sometimes because when I paint like higher end stuff for myself or for clients, I finish something and then I go to the next thing and blah, blah, blah. Because two things, it's more fun. And secondly, it looks way better on social media when you're like posting something. It's like, I finished this jacket, check out, the rest is black, but whatever, you know. Uh, but anyways, so when you're doing that, by, by doing that, it, it, it makes it easier for you and it saves time to don't have to go in and like get in and touch up a bunch of different colors because you accidentally slid with your brush over something. Um, so, so, so for ex absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm a, I'm a notorious batch painter. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the reason I'll never win Golden Demon is not my ability, but rather I don't have the patience to work on one model. Right. Um, but I, I, I'll, I paint 40 models at a time, and I, I, I do that. I, I, I paint one color or I do all the base colors, then I do all the washes, and then I do all the highlighting. Yeah. Um, 
while other people will work one color at a time. So they'll do their blues, then they'll do their the blue wash, they'll do their edge highlighting, yeah. one, two, three layers, and then they'll work on the other. Or they might start from the middle and work, you know, work outwards. So there's a there's different styles for different people. And that's a benefit um, to Citadel colors too, is that you have what's called a base color, right? And they cover really easily and, and you don't have to struggle with doing a bunch of layers uh, with them. You can do like the two thin coats or you know how many that you might need. I mean, it depends on the on the specific paint pot, right? But but the base colors are really nice. And then by doing that and blocking all the colors in doesn't mean that you have to save that layer. Right. You don't have to have if you say, for example, you want a yellow armor and you start off with Averland Sunset. OK, Averland Sunset might be the yellow that you want to look like. But if you want something more saturated, like an Ayanda yellow or Iria yellow, I don't remember which is which here. But but in that that way, you 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 can put that color on top of the Everland Sunset. And that way, it's way easier to get that coverage with the uh, Ayanda yellow or Iria yellow. Uh, then it would be to go on with that on top of a black straight up, right? I was just about to say, yeah. I remember I remember when my little brain learnt <laughs> that I shouldn't go from black <laughs> to yellow or black to white. Right. I remember I remember getting really frustrated and the amount of layers that I would have to do for white and yellow, yellow, even orange to a degree. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not the best, they're not the best colors. They, you know, when you think about color saturation and, and just laying down a color. Reds, blues, purples are beautiful. Yep. The minute you start doing yellow, you you find that you need more coats. It's harder to do the thin coats. And, you know, going from black or even gray to yellow yeah. is, is is a bit shite. And it's, I remember, it's, I remember it's, picking up the technique of brown. Like someone said, just do an intermediate layer of brown. Mm. It's not the color, but it will complement. And yeah. my, my yellows look brighter. Um, you know, working off and going from black to like a uh, uh, like a, a, an off white, um, and building up to my eventual white. I'm like, oh, yeah, this looks so much better, and I need so less paint. And I'm not clogging up my de my details. Yeah, no, I, and I and I wanted to, what I was trying to say there is that you know uh, the, the the reason why orange and and yellow, for example, are harder to cover with is because the pigments are are, are less dominant. Then, for example, the, the the red, and by dominance I mean they 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 are not as sort of the, the, it's hard to explain, but but they but they they are harder to make them luminous. You need to prep those colors a lot more, and that's exactly what you're getting into later. Is is to say if you put a brown, a lighter brown, and then start working that up towards the yellow, the colors are gonna look way better. And that's exactly what I like to do when I paint is layer. And anybody who's seen my tutorials know that layering is the way that I love to do things. And that I, that's what I encourage people to do because the colors are just way richer when you yeah. set them up and prep them to be shining and, 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 and the, the best that they can be by going those steps by, by small, you know, mixing in of that color to, to layer on top of each other. You're just, prep it you know it's just prepping it way better you don't have to do this you can do a an everland salsa slap by an and yellow on top of it and be done uh but if you mix a little bit of a yen and yellow into the everland sunset and do a 50 50 before you, you go to the full yen and yellow it looks a little bit more luminous in the end the things that i would have loved to, andrew yells is just making me laugh <laughs> Layers for life, only thick paint. I, if I knew what I knew now as a kid, because again we had the, yeah. the painting Citadel models, and it was a book. It was no videos. I remember when Games Workshop brought a DVD, blew my blew blew my little lights out. I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, even little things like you know we used to have inks, and I remember having chestnut ink, and I would never dilute the ink, and I just slap that ink in, and it would just look like hot garbage. Right. Uh, the beautiful thing now is there are so many tools and techniques to help you um, learn. And I think, you know, you've got exposure here. I wanted to pull up a comment from Robert here as well, which I think is a really good point, is he talks about his water cup. But the reason why I want to pull up the water cup is, again, we talk about pigments and we talk about metallic pigments. Mm -hmm. And the simple thing of having a separate brush that's purely for your metals mm -hmm. because the way that the metal pigments interact with the brush and stay on the brush will impact, I guess, the brush longevity, but also um, the way the interact. You know, you might wash your yeah. brush in the cup, um, 
but it'll there'll still be re uh, remnants on they'll be you around your red tier blues yeah. so having two different paint cups but also having two different paint brushes so making sure that when i paint my metals i'm using my metal cup and my metal brush right and not and not um uh not impacting my regular colors yeah i don't do that <laughs> you know, I just had a we all, we all as painters, I just had a big spiel about it. Are you like, yeah, I do that? Yeah, I mean, you know, we all as painters, we have our things that we are like, you know, this is what I do, and it's religion, and I don't change it, and you know, like I believe in this, and other things, you're just like, meh, you know, yeah. and and I'm one of those people. I don't sit and separate my water cups. I don't separate my brush. I wash them out very, very well before I start interlooping, but there's that you're definitely going to find, uh, uh, you know, that, that eventually you may run into some problems. I don't, I haven't really seen a whole lot of problems because I layer colors on top of each other so much that I think they just disappear at some point. Uh, but I think that to, to your point though, by separating and making sure that you use a separate brush for your metallics, you don't want to use your best brush for metallic colors. That's important, however, and I don't do that um, because the metal flecks are actually metal and it will grind down your brush. So whenever I layer something or I or I use these these uh, uh, you know metallic colors, I always use a brush that I'm not so careful about, and I always try to don't do the metal last when you've painted everything around it because if you have a brush that you're not so careful about, then that tip doesn't need to be perfectly sharp. You can use a brush that is a little worn down already. And that way, if you get a little bit of paint flex on top of the stuff around, you're just gonna paint over it anyway, so it's easy to touch up. So that's a way to get around it without having to think too much about, you know, oh, well, I can't use my shit brush because I'm just gonna mess up painting with it. And I don't wanna do that because I spent all this time on these other parts of the model. So try, try to swap that around and do the metals first. It definitely is going to help with that. I actually do my metals first as well, especially because often mm -hmm. with my metals, I'm using the dark washes. So I'm using blacks. Yeah. So if the black does run somewhere or I, I, I can clean it up, the last thing I want to do is have that the metal flex hit my yellows and my whites or yes. the null and the oil kind of seep in. So um, that's a really good tip as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a lot, and, and and finally, when we're talking about brushes, there's one more thing I want to talk about, and that is brush care, and that is uh, getting a brush soap, a brush conditioner. Yes. Um, I think I use the the masters. I think it is. I'm, I'm looking around my table, and I think I've got it on my other table. But just making sure that you you clean your brush. Uh, this 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 little thing costs you like ten bucks, fifteen dollars. Uh, I've had mine for like three. Yeah, I've got the same one. Literally the same one. Um, Buy it yeah. from an art store, buy it online, $10, $15. It's lasted me three years, four years, still got half of it left. Yeah. Uh, it is brilliant. Not only do you go to the art store by medium, go buy a brush cleaner. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely things that, you know, um, that you can get for cheaper if you're working at a high production rate. I mean, I definitely am not going to be the one that says don't support Games Workshop. I mean, they, they put out the, the the models that we love and the more money we put into them, it seems like the more shit they give us. So, I mean, I don't feel like that company is the one that sits and, and swallows all our money and then laughs at us and points in our direction. Uh, but if you are on a, on, a, on, a, on a in a place where you need to, you know, you want you need a lot of medium and buying like 15 pots of Lamy medium might be a little hefty of a bill at the end of it then buy yourself a little bit of other type of medium. And you might want to uh, research that as well before you go and just pick up medium in the store because some mediums work differently than others. And you definitely want to make sure you get the right stuff um, because a lot of the things in the art store is also very notable. A lot of the things that you find in the art store is not meant for miniature painting. It's meant for heavy body acrylic painting or heavy body oil painting or whatever you go for, right? Um, so, so when you're buying things from art store, you got to make sure that, you know, maybe it needs to be diluted, you know, maybe the medium is too thick and you need to thin it down a little bit with something. I go I, two to one. I, I'll, yeah. I'll go two to one. I'll go, I'll go, I'll, I'll mm. go buy a little bottle that you can go buy from an art store. Like yep. it's just an empty bottle and put a third, a third medium, two thirds diluted water. I don't go buy water from the tap. I yeah. get the diluted water because yep. it stays fresh 
um mm -hmm. it, it, and it reacts better to paint because yep. there's a lot of things in our in our water and, and it, whether you're drinking town water refined water whatever it might be the distilled water that you put in your um it's filtered yeah yeah, yeah your filtered water yep. um just goes a long way yeah no absolutely that's a really good point really important point too is to to know know what you're using and 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 i also think that um you know the, the the heavier body acrylic paints is also you got to be a little careful with there's there's that um pure white kind of color that's uh, uh going around on the on the on the internet right now uh i have it it's fantastic it's it's great but but it's different you know it's it's different and that leads me to the to the, to the next topic that we were kind of starting to get into with you know what's the difference between vallejo paints and you know uh scale 75 paints and uh citadel paints well if i get to put my two cents into i don't shop by brand i shop by color so i will go to a store and i will find a scale 75 color and then i find a citadel color and then i find a vallejo color and then i look at all three and i say which one do i like the most which one is is the one that's for me and you do definitely need to be aware of that vallejo and skill and citadel they function differently because they're cooked up differently i'm assuming you know that, that's just how paint works there's different ratios and uh products that they're using to make the color but so so you need to be aware that they function differently and whenever you take a scale color out and the citadel color you need to be aware that like it's not going to go on to the miniature the same way and you might have to like do a few few different few more coats with a scale color for example and uh i also know that they feel different because they're gel based i believe um yeah yeah, yeah but, you, you can just see how it flows from the dropper bottle as opposed to the pot. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And 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 I, for example, I'm I'm a big sucker for the uh, scale seventy five metallic colors um, than I am about the Citadel colors. Uh, I know that Vince, for example, loves the 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 sort of uh, metallics that Vallejo does. This yeah, this is this is the one that I'm using from yeah. Vallejo. I, yeah. I swear by this. I still like uh, Retributor mm -hmm. Gold. I, I love Retributor Gold from GW. Right. But the silver, this this silver here, uh, yeah. I will never use another silver. That <laughs> just, I think I have like three pots. Yeah, um, and this is airbrush as well. But it's just right. so smooth, so clean, and the the color is just so vibrant. Right. No, that's that's a, that's a great point for sure. Is you, you got to find what works for you and what you like and what you don't like. And, oh, no, there's and, my, medium, my medium, literally right next to me. That that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Of water, a little bit of medium mixed with water yeah. and. And that's how I'll um, uh, dilute my paint a little bit. Yeah, I, I dilute all my paints with a little bit of airbrush uh, uh, flow improver, airbrush flow improver. Uh, and I do this because the airbrush flow improver has a little bit of retarder in it, uh, which essentially is a, a medium that slows the drying process of the color. Um, it also helps to thin the colors down a little bit as they are in the pot. Um, so it helps to, for example, when you're airbrushing, you already have some in there. When you're putting it on the palette, I feel like it's not drying as fast. Even, even, even on a, if you're using a dry palette, and that's great. If you're using a wet palette, it just stays wet longer. And it also doesn't dry as fast on the miniature. And that for me is really good. You, you got to get used to it if you're used to that acrylic, like super quick dry time. Um, I don't think it's that much difference, but it gives enough difference to where you can put down a color and you can get the next color and you can put it down and then you can start blending the two. It makes it easier to wet blend too. Uh, if that's a technique that you're interested in going. I was for. literally about to say, this is a great example of a technique yeah. that you might learn a little bit later called wet blending. Um, and, and a good use of wet blending, for example, is when I do my squigs, um, the underbelly from the squig, if, if you've ever painted a more crusher or a squig, some type of beast with an underbelly, the underbelly is never the same color as the, the regular skin. But yeah. it will kind of, and and you, you can't just have like a block of color, like, you know, the body is just like a square or an oval. But with wet blending, you can kind of have this color in the middle, the regular skin, and then you kind of blend the 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 body to the regular skin and it yeah. looks more neutral and there's like a vibrant transition as opposed to just yes. a blocks of color. And you yeah. do that by having uh, the paint a bit wet and then you're able to kind of uh, blur it and kind of like squish it around. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the key thing when you're blending color is that you you have one color that you put the colors down with, and then you have another brush that you blend with. And preferably, that brush is 
dry. It's not wet. So that helps to control the pushing of the paint. It doesn't introduce more uh, you know, water or medium to it. It just allows for that brush to do what it needs. And, and if, you, if you know like art, art, not Warhammer art, 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 um, then you can see that they have specific brushes that are called like a fan brush that's like specifically made for that specific technique of blending things together. Um, in this case, we don't really have that, but, but anything from like a, like a smooth, um, you know, round dry brush. I'm looking around my studio. I was going to say, it's kind of like an, a, a dry brush, by the way, yeah. another hobby tip folks, go to your local, uh, cheapy store. I know there's a couple of like Asian Diatsus and types of stores like that. Go buy yourself some cheap makeup brushes. Mm -hmm. They are so good at dry brushing. Don't steal your wife's. She will kill you. Go buy some separate dry, uh, 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 makeup brushes. Yeah, uh, they are so good for dry brushing, especially like large things. If you're dry brushing yes. a monster tank, whatever. Um, yeah, the, the 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 harder the bristles are, the the hairs, the more uh, streaking you get. So if you're looking for to get a technique where the streaking is really noticeable, where you want that texture, you want to go for a rougher uh, bristle. If you if you want something to be smooth, then the smoother they are, the better. And makeup brushes are extremely smooth, so that that's essentially what you would use it for to get that really smooth dry brush. Yeah, there's a lot of cool tools that we we have outside of the hobby that you don't think about. And again, this is kind of where I'm like, there are different tools and techniques. And uh, you know, moving to Vallejo, moving to Scale 75, uh, I've been picking up different primers. Um, uh, there's another, you know, there's there's a whole bunch of cool resources out there. Um, is it Green Stuff World have the uh, the color shift? So if you're doing like um, your deep kin and you want like some very nice, you know, that fishy kind of like metallic colored transitions i think there's a couple of brands that have this color shifting type product but again there's just so many tools and techniques out there to again come back to what am i trying to achieve right what are the tools and resources out there to help me get there yeah no absolutely absolutely is there anything that you've learned over time that you wish you knew earlier Oh, so many things. So, so many things. I mean, I, I think one of the, you know, Duncan Rhodes re released a video not too long ago uh, about like the six things that he wished he knew when he started painting and he shows his first model and, you know, it looks like anybody's first model. It looks like my first model too. Um, and, and he goes through that, that list. So, I mean, it's, you know, paint with two thin coats, thin your paints, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I think to, to, to go, stray away from that and think of something that he necessarily didn't mention is overlapping. I think overlapping colors helps a whole lot. And this is something that I'm teaching to my apprentice as he's working right now is if you have a glove that's holding a sword and you paint the glove first or the sword, since it's metal, right? But you paint either first to make sure that you overlap the color so that the there isn't, it doesn't, you don't paint the glove and you be really careful not to hit the sword. And then you go and you try really hard not to hit the, the, the glove. In that way, there's a natural overlapping of the two colors and you don't get a third color that sits in between the two. That's, that's my best advice that, um, that I wish I knew. I like it. I yeah. like it. Sorry. I was also partially drawn. I just saw your tattoo of your, uh, the Stormcast hammer. Um, I don't think I'd notice that. No. <laughs> the corn, the corn and the storm cast. That's right. There is someone who's legit straight <laughs> up Age of Sigma. Oh, I love it. That's so cool. Um, look, yeah, I, I think, you know, there, there are a lot of cool techniques out there. I think mm -hmm. the, the, for me, the, the, the trap is just trying to do everything at once and, yeah. um, really just, you know, thinking about yourself as an, as a, as a professional who's learning not comparing to other people and just trying and um, introducing new concepts, trying things out. I think for me, if I, if I could go back in time and tell myself some things, I would say, keep trying different things, keep trying different colors, techniques, um, talking to my really good friend, Deke, who is a, an incredible painter, you know, one of my favorites. Um, 
I remember him teaching me something simple with purple, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we normally go base color, wash, layer, layer. I remember Dig telling me with purples to get a better purple from Games Workshop, you go purple, base, layer, wash, layer. Mm -hmm. And that little trick has brought out so many better colors out of my purple because it's a bit of a funny color. Um, Yeah, yeah, it is, it is. But there's just these little things, these little one percenters. So expose yourself, try it. If you like it, continue it. If you don't, see how you can improve. Just keep testing yourself. I I think it's also one of those things, thinking back about that, you know, like I I think most people wish that they would have sought out and learned something earlier, whether it's, you know, in Warhammer in life, you know, we we always have those regrets that, ah, I wish I would have, you know, yada, yada, yada. I think there's also that natural draw to something. So when you do feel excited about something, go explore it. You know, I mean, for me, it was, I wanted to learn non-metallic metal. I I dabbled in it before, didn't really hit the mark on it. So for me, it was, all right, let's paint an army and see what we can do with it. So I researched a bunch of YouTube videos. I, I watched Painting Buddha. I watched a bunch of other you know, I looked at a bunch of pictures online, like Ricardo Frizzoni's work. And, you know, it, it's one of those moments where you, where you like, okay, if I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do it. And I'm going to learn this and I'm going to, you know, come out at the end successful. And if, if, and then, and then that also sets up a little bit of discipline to it, you know what I mean? But I think if you're not feeling drawn to a specific technique, I don't think it's your time to learn it yet. And because I, I think that there's, there's especially with non-metallic metal, it's a technique that's so hyped right now that I think a lot of people may feel a little bit of pressure to learn it because it's the right. way that things need to be. And that's and now, definitely not true. And now because everyone's doing non-metallic metal, people are now doing true metallic metal. Right, right, and right, right, and right. so it's like, oh, well, if everyone's doing this, I need to do one better. Um, right. I think one thing I just kind of come to my mind is, as you know, taking myself back to a kid when I was first learning, um, Painting Warhammer at the time felt like an army investment. I didn't want to buy a new army to learn a new technique. It was just like the mindset that I would have had as a kid. But now I reflect and I think about Necromunda, I think about, uh, not Necromunda, like uh, Underworlds. I think about these little warbands that come out that allow me to test, try a new concept with such a small um, investment. And I I don't have to go and buy, I, I I don't have to go out and buy half an army to get a character and a couple of troops. There's so much diversity in Underworld's War Cry that allows me to test different concepts and things and uh, and then bring those ideas and lessons to a full army. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. It's 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 a great way to start with a concept, get a couple of models, try it up. And and the Warbands is definitely like one of those where you can just have it as a palette cleanser in between projects. I always love to paint an army. And then I do some small projects and then I do another army and then I do some small projects because it, it, it just kind of refreshes you and gets, gets you back into excitement about something like a bigger project. Um, but, but, but yeah, I, I think whenever you're, whenever you're trying out a concept, it's always good to like do a test model first and not just dive straight into it so that you, I am terrible and, and my girlfriend will definitely, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, tell you that this is true but i am terrible at at like envisioning something uh before i can actually see it in in hand i i i have strategies to how i get to the results that i get to but i can't like envision something and say this is going to look fantastic i've never seen it done before but this is going to look fantastic let's go i need to like sketch that out otherwise i have no idea what i'm getting myself into and it might look like crap um so Test models is absolutely the best friend that you have when you're trying to coin another concept and, and just sometimes even doing a a few of them, you know, do four. It doesn't have to be. We get worried about ruining models, but actually like go, go, go buy a secondhand box of something, go buy the model realms magazine, go buy, um, you know, like if you can find someone selling, you know, a kit at half price or three quarters price, Go buy it and use it as testers. You know, I used to use Ace Marines as a tester. Um, But then, you know, like I'm thinking, you know, but then I need to find, uh, like Ogres are another good tester for me because while Space Marines are very smooth and very hardline edges, 
that's not reflective of all of Age of Sigma. So finding right. other things like ogres allows you to test freehand, tattooing, skin tones, you know, OSL, metallics. And you know what? If, if I ruin it, if I don't like it, I could always strip it, get yeah. some simple green isopro alcohol, or just throw it away. Who cares? Um, yeah, I mean, it, give, it, it, give it to somebody. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that you know you're 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 in this hobby, and uh, you know we're not going to try to kid ourselves, but this is uh, like a little bit of a it, it it is an expensive hobby. Let's call it what it is. You know, I think that when you're investing a lot of money and time, and if you're painting an army, whether you're painting it at, at like your tabletop or whether you're painting it to a masterclass project doesn't matter you're putting a lot of time into just blocking in colors on models i mean there's hours and hours and hours hundreds of hours to do that with a with a full 2500 point army right with some choices to a 2k army you gotta you, you if it, you know there's nothing worse than to get to that point where you've painted half the army and you're like shit this wasn't it i convinced myself for half the army that this was it and now I'm bored of it because it isn't the one thing that I really truly wanted and you could have painted a couple of models and scrubbed them off or bought a couple of extra and invested that because in the grand scheme of thing if you're paying for a 2500 point army you're already paying a lot of money so get an extra box do a couple of test models and and just do yourself the favor of like doing the, the the little bit of extra work that it takes to paint those models to not get disappointed halfway through it's not yeah. worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Especially like I see people, uh, and this might be a tip that I would provide to somebody, is people are always doing their characters first. They, you know, they're the things that people really enjoy. Yeah. But I find through the process of painting an army, I learn things. I get better at the skill. And if I've painted my characters first, it means my battle line or my regular troops are maybe better than what my characters were. Yeah. Uh, and I maybe have to go buy the characters again, or my characters aren't as good as they would have been if I save them for last. So I think even just the order for myself, I have as cool as it is to paint characters, I need to just pace myself so that I know that the best outcomes will come at the end. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think there's another thing that's like whenever you're painting an army and a concept and you're doing all the work, and even if you're you're sculpting and all of that doing the characters for, like there's a there's a time period for you to get used to the colors and how they function and i think that you know some colors dry really fast other colors dry really slow and it takes a couple of miniatures a few miniatures maybe a squad to to, to get into the colors that you're using what you're trying to do and then by saving the characters for last you already kind of know the color scheme and it might not be as fun as to just dive straight into the cool catacros model but I do my characters last. I, I I think I've had for the past decade is to save those for last. I mean, Catacross was the last model I painted in that yeah. uh, in that in that first part of his commission. We divided it up, so that's why it's weirdly sounded. But but yeah, so that was a way for me to like get to know the colors, get to know what I'm doing, and then dive into this model that he spent way more money also on this model than he did for the rest of the art for the for the smaller parts of the army. So this is at a much higher level. So that also means by getting used to it, you can pump this up and do yeah. that extra mile on these things because you know the basics now. So why don't explore with a few extra highlights, maybe a cool technique like non-metallic metal or glow effects or whatever. Break, break up your units as uh, break up your units with minor characters, um, maybe a little wizard, maybe mm -hmm. a little you know, hero, but you know, try to save your big monsters, your big troops. Uh, your centerpieces. Your, your centerpieces to the yeah. very end. A um, couple of rapid fire questions I want to ask from uh, the chat or Twitter, um, a whole bunch, and in Discord as well, a whole bunch of people ask me a oh, bunch wow. of questions. Um, so a couple of rapid fire questions. So uh, Todd E asks, uh, what techniques do you use specifically to speed up your painting progress? Um, I definitely use airbrush, um, uh, which which helps with techniques like OSL. Um you know, if I'm doing something very, very elaborate, I, I might start with airbrush just to kind of get that sort of feeling to it. And then I go in with glazes and touch up and add things and subtract things and, and get that technique done right. But a lot of times I just airbrush it on and, and let it be that way. Um, other ways, as I mentioned before, is I, I block in everything and then I go to the rest of the steps because in that way, 
you've already done the labor of the work, which I call it because I'm not a fan of blocking in colors, even though I do it on a daily basis, 360 days a year, feels like 400 <laughs> days a year. Um, you know, but, but, that way, if you mess up, you can clean all of that up really fast before you move on to the stage where you kind of seal it with a wash. It just makes it a whole lot easier. Those are my two top things to to, to speed up the painting process. Yeah, I, I, I mentioned I'm a block painter. I paint um, I paint batches of 20 to 40 models at a time. Yeah. Uh, it is boring and it's tedious. And I know some people don't enjoy that. But for me, if I have my my blues or my reds or my colors, it means I could hit all the blues in one go and then apply the wash. And then by the time that I've done uh, model one, uh, so, so by the time I've, I've finished model 40 or model 20, yeah. it means model one's dry and then I can go back to the start of the process and then hit the wash. Then by the time I finish that, usually the wash is dry. So it means that I, I find that I'm being more productive and I'm getting more more hobby done, which means I've got my momentum and motivation because I'm I'm feeling the progress. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, and that's to say, if you have a hard time with batch painting, then just do ten. You know, to take small bites, just do a unit and then move on. Like for the stormcast that I did, I had to batch paint that, and that was non-metallic metal. Like ninety-five percent of the whole model was non-metallic metal. So I batch paint in in, in threes and fives. Because it, it was just it was just faster to get it done, and non-metallic metal is oftentimes like you 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 know how can you do that on more than one model? But after I painted a few of them, I learned the colors, I learned the the repetition of how things worked, and I started be able to do that. So that's another way reason to to like do those test models, get into the groove, and then start doing the, the batch paintings or the ones that when you've learned what you're doing and what your goal is with this project. Um, Great point. Only, yeah, yeah that, that, that's, then that's, that's personal number three, five, yeah. seven, ten. It's arbitrary. I, I just find having a batch, batch yep. of three, just helps you because you're in the flow and you kind of get the grooves of the body and that's right whatever you're painting um aussie wargamer had mentioned something around brush control i think this is something that a lot of people uh have trouble with and it, it's something that it really comes with time you know how do you do you have any any tips to improve you know brush control people uh, are shaky some people it's really hard to get you know fine detail i know things like painting eyes can be intimidating because you've got mm -hmm. to have like this this absolute you know for one second just like strike a perfect line um you know like brush control can be very difficult yeah, uh, yeah. do you have any tips or thoughts around how someone could um help themselves or you know the first thing I think is important to mention that, you know, practice makes perfect. And, and I know that it's not the, the answer that a lot of people want to hear. A lot of people want to hear that like golden advice that like instantly changes the game. But unfortunately that's not necessarily true in a lot of cases. Uh, so by just continuing to paint, continuing to having fun, because if you're having fun, then it's easier to learn in my opinion, continuing to do the work, then your brush control will get better. Uh, but when it comes to straight lines, I have a little bit of an advice and it's going to be a little bit of a hard thing to show on camera here. I'm going to try, but I have a pen right here. So imagine this being a brush. Oh, that's you. That's me. I want, I want to <laughs> right, do. Here we go. There we go. Here we go. All right. So instead of like, it, it, say for example, that you're, you're, you're going to draw a line on this hand here, instead of drawing it like this, where you go sideways with your hand, you're holding the brush oftentimes. Some people hold it like this, other people hold it like, like I don't know, you know, but I, I hold it like this, right? So it's kind of like a grip. Instead, if you go with your hands down, see so that everybody can see, like this, you're only moving your fingers. Uh, so I'm gonna show from the front, you're only moving your fingers like this when you're drawing that straight line. And that way, if your hand is propped up against something so that it can lean properly, and then you draw that line to get that that highlight. Then it's going to be way more stable for you, in to to be able to get that straight line than it is if you're moving sideways or if you don't have anything to prop it up against. Uh, and that's another reason why having a brush handle or uh, a miniature handle, whether it's the you know, Redgrass Citadel, there's probably more 
companies that produces them, but getting a brush handle, it allows for you to hold it with one hand, right? And then to, to some extent, put your put your hand onto the other hand and, and sort of have a stable place to, to do all the lines when you're doing it. And then you can screw it around or you can finagle it in your hand to get that angle where you can get that line in and boom, it's done, you know? Um, otherwise, I think, you know, cleanup is a really important lesson also. You know, my straight lines and my work does not come without cleanup. Everybody messes up. It's it's just name of the game when it comes to paint. Um, by going in and just crisping up a highlight or crisping up something, you know, you, 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 you do that little uh, dot in the eye and the eye doesn't end up where it needs to be. You know, go back in with some white and see if, if the circle is too large. See if you can just like get that reflection in the eye in because that can help to just shift it to one side or the other uh, to make them look in the same direction. And don't just like throw your brush away and repaint the whole eye and, you know, sometimes just going in and try to save it with a little bit of a dot and doing the same thing that you did the first time. But again, painting eyes, it took me a while to learn how to do it well. It is a hard thing. But I also use a triple zero or a double zero brush to do that. I'm not trying to go in there with a size two mamma jamma, you know. <laughs> and things like eyes, you can buy like painting magnifying glasses as well, like the little, mm -hmm. you know, give, give you a better view depending on your sight. Yep. Um, I, when I very first bought painting handles, because I was painting my, like, my big billion grots, yeah. I was not going to buy. 40 to 80 citadel paint handles and nor would i go out and replace every model from the handle when i was painting right so i bought wine corks you can buy a bag yeah. of wine yeah. corks the corks are on the top with a bit of blue tack and they're all now on handles and it makes it easier to paint uh but also as well i think the as you've mentioned the positioning whether i rest my arms on my elbows whether i, I rest one hand on another um you know using the your, the, the table um that can help stabilize um and and reduce the shakes yeah no absolutely absolutely the wine corks is a, is, a, is a great example i i use wine corks and painting handles yeah so, so I, I. I, I i use whatever i can find because i can't afford you know 30 painting handles so i have some wine corks i have some little other type of cork bottle uh uh closers or whatever they're called to to, to sort of like the, the bigger rounder ones where you can put a bunch of different things if you're painting heads for example then you can put like six different heads and you just go bloop and then you spin bloop, and then you spin bloop, and you just kind of do all of the different things on all of the heads and you go around in a circle and that's batch painting yeah you know if you're sub assembling for example and another another good use your old paints so if you're old, put a bit of blue tack on top of one of your old citadel paints you got a little handle yeah so yeah yeah you're throwing it away that there's another example sky's the limit okay. um D uh, the car and Dan wanted to ask about um, OSLs. Do you have any, like, any anywhere someone could find uh, a bit of a recipe, a bit of a, a tutorial? I know for me, uh, OSL, um, yeah, yeah. A a anything for you that you, you – do you have a tutorial about OSL? I do. Uh, it's not marked as OSL because I sometimes can be a dumbass, and that's just how I roll. Um it is embedded into the Chaos Warrior tutorial. Um, it's a tutorial that focuses on true metallic metal, and then I also do OSL effect for the glowing runes. Um, so the way that I go about it in this tutorial, and I really recommend you guys go and watch it if you are interested in OSL, because I have a little trick in there that, yes, you can find the links to my channel down below. Um, the, the, the way that I do it is that I brighten up the source of the light first. So I start by taking, okay, so if you have a light bulb, right, you paint the light bulb uh, white, and then you go in with either glazing or airbrush and put the color on top of it, and the rest of the stuff around it is a much darker color. That gives you a, a much cooler effect where you get the light source to be really, really bright, and then the halo is is like more muted and that gives you a good definition between what's the light source and what is the actual light because that's sometimes what i see when osl isn't really working out as as much as possible you know 
it's because they don't differentiate between where the light hit a different surface and a color and what the light source is. And they try to brighten that up and brighten it up and brighten it up by just putting white down. It's just much faster and it gives the effect a, a really cool glow, you know? And for anyone who doesn't know what we're talking about, OSL is an object source lighting, which is yes. essentially, if you think, if you've anyone seen like the Night of Xeros, for example, that has a lantern. Uh, so if you want to paint the lantern, the lantern is bright, uh, is, is shining bright. Mm -hmm. uh, you obviously want to have that source of light, which is going to be the center of the lantern. But yep. then as what Oscar's talking about, the, the light color, whether it's red, blue, yellow, orange, yep. whatever it is, hitting the sides of the lantern. And that's not going to be the same color as the light source. So how do you try to replicate a spotlight, whether it is uh, from, you know, there's probably a million things, you know, maybe they're in a cave and, you know, there's a bit of light coming through uh, mm -hmm. a, a glowing gnar, gnar hole or, you know, a bit of right. uh, warp stone or whatever it might be. So uh, that's the technique we're talking about here, folks. Yeah, yeah, it, it, exactly, exactly. Um, and, and the lantern, for example, like you would, you would paint the lantern the, the, the sort of glass that sits in front of the, the, the light source inside of there, you would paint those little windows white and the grid would be black. And then you put the color on top of it. And all of a sudden you separate the glass from the bar, but the bar still has a little bit of a halo on it. Like it's colored in. Uh, and that way you really start to separate and get a glow effect. And then you just either glaze on top of the model, or if you can get in with the airbrush, you can put a little color where the light would hit on the model or the environment around it. That's all Stra it. Strayo wanted to ask around, do you paint your army in a uniform colors or do you use like, you know, psychedelic different kind of models, uh, colors with models, and then you try to tie them in with, you know, uh, particular, you know, shoulder pads or, you know, ways to kind of denote that they are a part of the same force, but they're very different chapters or uh right. you know like a, like i say a stormcast unit like let's say a stormcast army all the sequins don't look the same but maybe you have you know this unit leader and this unit is different to the other unit of sequitors you, you you mean for example that with stormcast you would have uh one part of the army being hallowed knights and the other one being hammers of sigmar for example yeah that could that, that, yeah. that could be a good example i mean you know there's nothing cooler than than finding that sort of inspiration where you're like you know what I'm going to take this Lord Celestin. He's going to be uh, whatever character from the books. And I'm going to have the Hallowed Knights. And you know, what is what is that guy's name? Steel something? Uh, Gabriel, Ga Gabriel Steelheart? No, uh, Steel Soul. Gabriel Shirt. Oh, sure. I'm thinking Shirt. Yeah, 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 but, yeah. But, that, but that's a good example to have on the on the Hammers of Sigmar side, right? So you have these two heroes and you're like, ah, I can't make up my way. Well, I'll split the army in half. And where they tie together is the light which uh, Vince and Sam talks about, and the basing, right? So keeping the basing consistent means that they're in the same location. Keeping the light uh, and, uh, you know, consistent means that they are also in the same location, and those two in combination will make it look very cohesive, even though they're painted differently. And when we talk about light, uh, I, I think, I don't know, but, but let's try to define that a little bit better. So, for example, light would be, you know, if you look at a movie, and you have, for example, um, something very saturated, something very vibrant like Star Wars, you know, that's shot in a very particular light with a very particular lens, right? It's very vibrant, it's very fragrant, it's got a lot of saturation, poppy colors, it's fun, and then you have 300, right? That's a very yeah. different type of light in that movie. It's very desaturated. There's a, there's, it's not, it's not, fully if i remember correctly it's not fully uh uh um uh you know achromatic it's got some color in there it's got a little bit of like def definition yeah, of color but it's very very sa desaturated right so it's the opposite of that so if you make one using the star wars light and one using the 300 light then that is not really gonna fit together on the same table but if you choose one and stick to that light then that will really help you to kind of get that vision realized i think yeah, that ties in really nicely with like you know i think about my gits right because my gits mm. is now a combo book between you know spiders trolls yes rocks. right you know no different to like the iron jaws now that being bundled together with the the bone splitters mm -hmm. so how do yeah. i how do i tie in bone splitters and i and uh, the iron jaws together yeah. um 
they aesthetically look very different. It's through, as you said, the basing, the colors, yeah. the the lighting. Um, two more probably rapid fire questions for you. Um, one, uh, Sean Benson, um, wonderful painter, um, has talked about skill plateaus. So um, how do you break past, you know, when you kind of hit this, this moment where you just can't get any better, um, you know, is there a way through deliberate and targeted practices that you could improve your skill? Wow, that is that is a complex question. Um, maybe maybe it's a video that you should unpack later. Maybe. Oof, I mean, maybe. Um, I mean, it's. I I don't feel personally that I have hit a plateau where I can't get better. But I, but I but I think I understand the concept because I. I think I've hit that in other fields of life. You know, when you're like, Shh, I don't even know where to go from here. Everything feels so goddamn abstract. You know, like I don't even. You know, you, you're telling me to focus more on non-metallic metal. Like I can't see how to improve this. The only the, I do want to answer that question better than I think I can right now. And maybe that's you know. Um, Maybe that's something that you and I can talk about later on in another video, or or maybe you know if 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 you email me, I can try to you know do a little bit more thinking on that question and get back to you on that. Um, but I think that it's really important that when you start to feel like there's a roadblock, to start to surround yourself with artists that can help to break you out of that feel like that 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 room that you're kind of locked in um and that can be by trying something completely different um by breaking out of that you know like say for example that you really like colors right you're 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 like me you you enjoy colors you 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 that's what drives you forward but you feel like i don't even know like what to do about to to make my colors better i'm i'm, I'm thinking to myself it might not be a bad idea to try to desaturate everything and do a lot more desaturated work for a while and try to see if that by playing with a, a smaller range of of that kind of color vibrancy if that can help you to find contrasts and enhance something that in contrast by by using more light to dark and you know learn how to smooth that out a little bit more that when you then go back into colors, you have another tool that you can bring in, that, that you bring in with those colors and, and, and maybe mix and match those things to, to sort of jumpstart you out of that slump where you feel locked in and, and, and plateaued a little bit. That's the best right. answer I can give, and, I, and I'm sorry if that doesn't help. No, that was, that was wonderful. I think for me, a couple of things that come to mind is uh, constructive challenge. So I think, um, uh, again, we, we keep talking about the, the the recent Warhammer Weekly episode where Sam and Vince were actually live streaming together in a house. And the reason they had done that is because those two and uh, Miniac Scott, uh, and there might have been some more people, maybe Adam, I don't know, there might have been a bunch of painters, right? But they were all together painting together over a weekend. Right. And they were probably challenging each other or probably exposing each other to new ideas. And it was through that immersion that they were able to break through any biases, any uh, any patterns that they, I always paint this way. Yeah. And through constructive challenge, Oscar could go, have you tried it this way? This is the way I do it. And, you know, I, I think about, you know, I could learn Japanese right now. I could go and do some classes and learn Japanese, but I will never be as good speaking Japanese as if I went to Japan and got immersed in the culture right. and, got, and practiced it deliberately you know, as frequently as possible. That's yeah. where my skill goes from like zero to a hundred. So if there are ways that you can create like a painting weekend with some really high quality painters, whether it's taking a, a workshop with another master painter, um, trying to find ways to get that immersion uh, as well as constructive challenge. Yeah. Um, I think can, can also, in addition to what you said, um, Oscar, yeah, no, absolutely, and, and I and I think even even more so now that you, now that you say it by by you know unfortunately it's twenty twenty, you know we we can't go to conventions to the same extent we can't go take classes which is a bummer because you know having a lot of these painters assembled in one under one roof and that you can go and and, and take an assortment of classes from a bunch of people that you know both differentiate from your style and that panders to your style 
is an amazing opportunity for you to go out and find and and, and even if even if the the class that you feel pretty confident in the technique that 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 you are doing like non-metallic metal in my way going to someone who does non-metallic metal in a different way because there's not just one way to paint it right can also allow for you not because it's not necessarily that you will go there learn their technique and that will make you a better painter it's going there learning that technique taking what you want from it and emerging it back into your style of painting and elevating your style of painting by using snippets of someone else's stuff that's the whole way i came up with that stormcast uh, non-metallic metal recipe that i did for the army i watched painting buddha and he wasn't gonna paint you know a whole army full of of, of those things and neither was i because painting it the way that he does takes way too long like he puts hours into that shit just a fucking leg you know that's crazy you can't do that for an army so i had to like dumb it down to some extent and try to see how simple can i make this technique and i had to do a lot of research because it wasn't a way that i could just come up with it right away and even even after i did that jimbo from the mitzi and jimbo show used my tutorial that i put up simplified it even more to see if he could simplify it even more and make it work. And he did. And it was amazing to watch that army come to life. It was such a like honor to just watch him paint. What a, what and a Jimbo was an awesome painter as well. Jimbo. Yeah. I, I like what you said as well about going outside of your space. And um, we mentioned this in the Asian video we had earlier around uh, Japan and wargaming in the East because they have a culture with this Gundam and this anime style. Yes. And they paint very differently. I love the Asian uh, painting style. But then I look at the Europeans, and the Europeans have a very different painting style. And then the Americans have a very different painting style. Yeah. Then I can also go one step further and look what they're doing in 40K. I could then go look at what they're doing in other areas. So yeah. I make a lot of terrain. So I, I love looking at – and I, I'm, um, when I, I, as I'm building my uh, armies on parade display boards – I don't look at Warhammer display boards. I look at railroads. I look mm -hmm. at people who are doing um, uh, World War II dioramas. Yep. I'm looking at uh, people who are using electronics, you know, LEDs. I, I'm Spoiler alert, I'm using smoke uh, a smoke machine, uh, a portable smoke machine is going to be in one of my Gargit display oh, boards. Oh, that's so cool. But, but, but we don't see that in Warhammer. But by right. getting exposed to other ideas and thinking, this kind of goes back to right at the start. How do I apply this concept in my army? How do I use dry ice? How do I use resin? How do I use mm -hmm. um, LEDs? And, you know, a simple way of doing it is with my loon shrine that's sitting right next to me, cut out the eyes, put a little bit of a LED, and now I've got a glowing loon shrine all from yep. a battery-powered LED. Yep. No, absolutely. I, I did the same thing for my Nurgle army display board. You know, that was... Uh, two jugs of table resin, high gloss table resin that I mixed in with a bunch of pots of blood for the blood God and just mixed it up and poured it over and did a bunch of different layers. And I, I did not get that idea from, from Warham. I got that shit from like doing Woodland Scenics tutorials. You know what I mean? And they, they don't, they don't mess with Warhammer. They're, they're doing other stuff, you know what I mean? But, but it's like the sources are endless. If you just yeah. allow yourself to to uh, to uh, uh, to immerse yourself into something different. Don't get don't get bogged down. Look yeah, at everything. Yeah, absolutely. Look at look at nature. Look at the world. Look at uh, I look at dollhouses. I go and look at how people build dollhouses because again, there are there are hobby techniques in there that I can draw upon inspiration. There is so much out there. It's 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 a wonderful rabbit hole. But again, kind of goes back to what we said at the start your true north, what am I trying to achieve, what is available to me in order to get the best outcome, and then the options just really explode. Mm -hmm. Final question for you before we kind of wrap things up. This has been an awesome chat, uh, uh, a lot of value. I hope people who have enjoyed this, uh, watch this, have really enjoyed it. The last question I've probably got for you is uh, a bit more around colour theory coming from Ian uh, Hannum. And mm -hmm. Ian had asked, you know, he'd love to hear some of your thoughts and ideas on non-conventional color tones with shades. So he's given us an example. So using pink to shade yellow um, or any, you know, any, any cool examples that, you know, you might have an impact. Um, 
any thoughts on or ideas around non-conventional color tones um, to shades? First of all, I want to say Ian Hannum is an amazing guy. He has a blog that you guys should check out. Uh, he's a fantastic painter. I had the privilege of meeting him in person in Nottingham the first time I went to Warhammer World. He drove up to meet me when I was a nobody to play with me. Man, what a great guy. Anyways. Shout out to Ian. How good is that? I mean, you know, like shout out where shout out is due. You know, I mean, it goes for Mitzi and Jimbo too. And, you know, Warp Charge Gaming, amazing people. You know, they, they contribute so much to the community that they're just doing out of the good natured heart. And I, I, I think they're amazing. Uh, and many more that I haven't shout mentioned. Please everybody. don't get shout upset. Out. If I if I don't mention you, it's not because I... Shout out to everybody. Everyone yeah. is amazing. And yeah. We, yeah, we name drop a bunch of people, but they are they yeah. aren't just the they aren't the only few. And I think oh no no no. Um, I think for you know we, we will end this show and I will let you answer in a minute. But yeah, there are so many cool people in the community that if you want to know more about true metallic metal using resin uh, edge highlighting. Um, you know, Darren Latham had a, a lot of cool videos around the um, the uh, heavy metal style. You know, yeah. if you want to learn about one one particular thing, there are now so many tutorials and so many discussions out there on YouTube. So go out there, go. If, if something here triggers an interest, go and search for it. Go search for Armies on Parade. Go see what people are doing. Go yeah. see their demonstrations. And then also like and comment on their videos and tell them how much you enjoyed it. But, Oscar, last question from Ian unconventional or non-conventional colors and tones yeah i mean you know when it comes to shading yellow with pink that i'm not familiar with that i i, I don't know if that's the, the the genius thing he's found now and he's testing me on it <laughs> or or if he's just throwing me a curveball we'll see how i respond I, i'm not sure he's a tricky dude uh but <laughs> i think when it comes to you know merging colors you know and using these kind of like poppy like pinks and magentas and yellows if, if we're going off of that colors and, and and sort of blending them together to make things i can't help but to think about louise sugden and i hope i pronounce her name right but oh my lord she is just a phenomenal painter when it comes to saturated color i mean it is every time i see her shit popped up in my feed i'm just like oh my oh here we go again you know like another success another success Wow. Uh, but but when it comes to shading with unconventional colors, I think that there's a way to look at scene and chaos concept where you, you think inverted. You know, if you put uh, light inside of in the shadows and dark on the outside, that's another way to like really make things work in a very strange way. Uh, having, um, you know, you know the, the, the way that we perceive things should look like because that's the way that we see it and then you invert a photo and it looks creepy and ghost-like. You can do that on, on certain aspects of the models to really kind of mess with the viewer's perception of what's what. And that's a really scene thing to do. So it would work really well on, on, on a model like that. Um, I think that one of the bigger lessons when it comes to using complementary colors to shade things with is that it, it, it like we said before, it allows uh, the colors to sort of emphasize each other and play off of each other. So when you, you know, go away from that, the normal strategy is to use a darker version of the color that you have on. So if you got green, you shade with a darker green, you know, that's one way to do it. And it's a simple way. It's effective. It looks good. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Using, you know, uh, 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 yellow and shading it with purple definitely gives a little bit more depth to things. Uh, it was actually Leonardo da Vinci that wrote uh, the first ever written documentation of seeing that uh, when a bird flies, that there's purple in the shadow from that bird. Uh, because the natural light from the sun it has yellow in it. So the complementary colors sits in the shadow naturally. It's just very hard to detect them. And that's the lesson that, that we can learn from it. It isn't to use a color to shade, to shade it with, it's to use an incorporation of that color to change, shade it with. So by combining using uh, a yellow 
or a browner yellow shade on a model on, that's yellow and then incorporating glazing in a little bit of purple into parts of that shadow where it's the darkest can really start to elevate uh, the way that the shadows work on the model itself. Uh, I don't know. Now I feel like I kind of have to try to shade a yellow with pink <laughs> just to see what it looks like. But Challenge accepted by Oscar. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> I think for me, like, and, and you know, this has been a robust two and a half hour conversation. Oh, yeah. And I don't think we've scratched the surface. I think we could be here for 10 hours and we'd still be talking about tools, tips, techniques. You know, we could go down so many rabbit holes and I could mm -hmm. share so much with you uh, what, uh, about what I've learned about resin and yeah. then what I've learned about um, green stuffing and then what I've learned about OSL and non-metallic metal and true metallic metal and colour theory and, um, you know, brushes and, and um, resources and there's just so much we could talk about here. And I think that was a nice little kind of uh, closing out moment here is that hopefully after this discussion, you have been inspired to try something new, to go learn something new and go push yourself. There is no such thing as failure. There is only feedback. They are yes. only plastic to toys. You can't ruin them. You can strip things. You can buy new ones. Go and try some new concepts. Go test it out. Go put it on Twitter or Instagram or talk to your friends, get some feedback, learn from the experience. That's the only way you get better. You don't build muscle at the, at the gym by lifting the same amount of weights again and again and again. That's you right. push yourself, you push yourself, and you will fail. The weights will collapse on you, but in turn, you grow strength and muscle. So my advice to you all is to take something here, go challenge yourself, whether it is looking at your next army and thinking, how do I apply a concept or what is the concept of this army? Whether it's to go research some tools and techniques, whether it's to ask for some constructive feedback on how you could improve or to try something that you've never tried before. I, I have never been strong on my skin so one of the ways I could learn skin is going, go picking up some Daughters of Cain. Uh, if I am not good at metals, I'd go find Necrons, for example. I keep saying Necrons, but like, you know, if I want to do that, if I want to, um, you know, there's, there's, there's Blood Bowl, there's Necromunda, there's 40K, there's Age of Sigma. There's just so much out there. There's something for you to practice a technique. That'd be how I would close this show out. Oscar, anything you want to say, final thoughts? I mean, you are just kind of hitting the 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 nail right there. I, I I think just just practice, just have fun with it. The, the the biggest the biggest heartbreak I see is when 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 people feel like their 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 armies aren't good enough. Your your army is always going to be good enough because you are at the point where you're at in your journey as a painter in Warhammer. Um, uh, trust me, when I started painting, I started young, and that's most likely one of the reasons why I'm, I'm better now. You know what I mean? It isn't because I have a God-given talent. It's because I spent over 20 years painting models all the time, all the time. I never took a break. I always painted, and I painted other things too. Stick to it. Have fun. Make another project. You, you do something. You have fun with it. You finish it. Be proud of your product, and then move on to the next thing and try something different. Learn the lessons that you learned. You, you can still assess what you are not content with on the army, but you should absolutely give yourself a pat on the shoulder and be proud of the product that you've done, always. Deliberate practice, practice every day, find 10 minutes to paint some models, doesn't matter. That's the only way you improve. Oscar, we are approaching three hours very quickly. So I'm going to ask you, I know oh, we're two, and a, like, two hours, 40 minutes now, uh, but I know that we could keep talking here. If <laughs> people, want, if people want to learn more about you. You do have a YouTube channel. I have got it in the description of this episode. Is there anything yeah. you want to shout out? Any final things that you want to call out before we kind of bring this home? No, I, I I think you know the 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 channel is Oscar Lars. If you search for Oscar Lars online, you get to my website, you get to YouTube, you get to Instagram, you get to Twitter. I'm I'm there under Oscar Lars for everything, so it's easier to find. Uh, if you are looking to pick up some skills, 
go go find our free to use tutorials we produce them for free we have amazing patrons who contribute a little bit of their money to make our production and improve our 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 um our our, our equipment we just got ourselves on a new camera i definitely want to make sure that i mention the amazing amazing guy who is editing those tutorials it's martin kramer He's a Netherlands uh, film editor. I mean, he is just a phenomenal dude and he's got the biggest patience because he's working with me. Uh, thank you so much for, for everybody who watched this show. I, I cannot state how much I appreciate you showing up and asking questions and engaging. And I really hope that you guys learned a lot from this. I had a blast being on this show. Well, it was, it was my honor. Go check out Oscar's channel. Go check out Vince Venturella's Hobby Hacks. Go look at Dana, Dana Howe. Go look at Sam Lenz's YouTube channel. Yep. Go look at Games Workshop who put out awesome tutorials. That is just the tip of the iceberg. There's probably a lot of people I've insulted by not dra name dropping them, but there are a lot of cool tutorial people out there. So with that, I want to thank uh, you all for hanging out. Thank you for hanging out for almost three hours with me. It was basically like a movie, but yeah. I'm sure that you all got some hints, tips, and techniques from this discussion. So thanks, folks. Thank you. G'day. I hope you enjoyed that video and you're left with some new ideas. One of the biggest ways you can contribute to AOS Coach is by liking the video you just watched and leaving a comment in the comment section. This lets YouTube know this is a good video and it should recommend it to other hobbyists. If you'd also like to support the channel even further like these bloody legends, go check out AOS Coach on Patreon. Otherwise, don't forget your triumph.